So this all ended a couple of months ago, and I only now feel comfortable with sharing it. For background, I'm a 24-year-old woman living in Australia and work at an establishment that caters for an adult audience. One night, as my shift is coming to a close, one of the patrons asked to buy me a drink, which I accept because of employer policy. I talk him up to a couple of expensive drinks for the two of us to have a quick conversation and make my excuses about my shift being over, but he should come back to see me soon. I feel his gaze undressing me in his mind. As he licks the splash of his drink from his upper lip, he stands up and with the creepiest grin asks to walk me to my car. Now, I'm no idiot. I know to never put myself in that position and politely declined him and told him I might see him next time instead. I walked past our biggest bouncer, and the guy didn't follow me. Great, nothing extraordinary, just standard par-for-the-course stuff in my profession. But sadly, this is not where our story ends. Oh no, for this creep it was only just beginning. I'm off for a week after that night. But when I come back into work, I'm told a patron has been coming in every night for the last week asking for me specifically. Says he wants to buy me another drink. Naively, I think to myself, oh great, a bigger pay this week. And get set for my shift. The night rolls on and who should roll in but our man of the hour. And he asks for me right away. I saunter over and he buys me a drink. The whole time I'm sitting there with him, he just has this creepy grin on his face. Not like your standard sexual undressing creep grin though, that's pretty normal. No, this was the kind of grin where he knows something you don't, and was very pleased with himself about that fact. So we're talking and I'm getting him ordering himself drinks and trying to sell him up where I can. About half an hour goes by, and I make up my excuse to leave so I can try to spread the tips around. But this guy was just not having it. He refused to let me leave, and the more I insisted, the angrier he got. He was practically hissy at me by the time I gave a look to one of the bouncers, who promptly came over and defused the situation, giving me an opportunity to finally walk away. Crisis averted. Wrong. The bouncer didn't throw him out, just gave me a buffer so this guy started following me around the entire place. Even attempting to walk into the employee-only area, which is where another bouncer finally noticed and kicked him out. I put it out of my mind and finish my shift for the night. I start to walk over to my car. There he is, I shit you not, sitting right on the bonnet of my car. How he knew which one was mine, I'll never be able to even guess. He tells me he wants me to give him a ride, and tells me how sexy I look, spewing all the greasy slimeball creep lines at this point that everyone does and I was really not interested. I tried to give him a hint and declined to give him a ride, but he just turned mean and grabbed me by my arm, insisting I give him one. Of course, I told him to get the fuck off me and jam my key into his shoulder as hard as I could. He let go, and I pushed him with all my might so he fell down. I jumped in my car, locked the door, and slammed that key in the ignition. He was back up before long, slamming on my window and angrily yelling to let him in. And I mean hard. So hard I thought either his hands or my window might give out. I gunned the accelerator and I was right out of there. When I get five minutes down the road and I'm sure I'm not being followed anymore, I pull over to the side and call back in to work. I told them what happened and alerted them that the other girls needed to be very careful leaving tonight. As I hung up the phone, I broke into tears. Now, this isn't my first rodeo. I'd been grabbed before and the sad truth is I probably will be again. But you never quite get used to it, you know? Eventually I composed myself though, pulled back onto the road and headed home. I cried myself to sleep. The next morning, word had gotten around and the owner called me to make sure I was okay. I assured him I was, but he insisted I take some time off in case this creep decided to come back. He wanted to put some distance between us, which makes sense. A week goes by, then two, the guy's still coming in every night asking about me and being told I quit and don't even work there anymore. A lie to get him to stop coming in, you know. But he just keeps coming in and asking, clearly not buying it. Then suddenly two and a half weeks in, he stops altogether. That was great to me. 
I was really needing money at this point, so I was happy to be able to go back to work the following week. Time goes on, and everything seemed to go back to normal. Same old chancers, but the good kind that lead to higher paychecks. The abusive guy didn't come back in, so I was happy. I started being forgetful, though. I thought I left the door closed when I left the house, but it was open when I got back. It would be lights on or off that weren't before, food left out, things ending up in different places than I remembered putting them down sometimes even moments before. I was losing it, but I thought it was probably just the stress of everything that had gone down. One of my close friends who worked with me reassured me that it was normal after being grabbed like that, and that feeling would eventually pass. This kept up for a whole month, though, until one day I headed out for work, got 15 minutes down the road, and realized I'd forgotten something I'd need that night at work. I head back home only to find the lights in my front room on, and the TV visible is on from the outside as well. I think to myself, I really am losing it. It's a good thing I came back, I guess. I head inside, grab my stuff, make sure to turn the TV off and the light out, and head to the door. Suddenly I freeze. There, standing and blocking the doorway, is that very same creep that grabbed me before. I'm stunned. My jaw dropped onto the floor. Then after what seemed like a lifetime of standing in silence staring at each other, him smiling that same creepy smile, I screamed. What the fuck? Get out! I'm screaming for him to go away and asking him what the hell he's doing here, how he knows where I live. Just one jumbled mouthful of confusion. He stands there with that smile on his face while I'm loudly freaking out. I start gasping for air in a mixture of panic attack and bewilderment. Then he decides to speak in my wake. The words just ooze out of him and leave me completely chilled. Welcome home, honey. You're back early. A switch goes off in my head. I throw everything I have on me at him and sprint to the back door. I'm outski. I like it faster than I have in my entire life, screaming bloody murder as I go. Of course, not a single person stops to help. Stupid, apathetic society. I hide in some bushes around the corner, tears running down my face, gasping for air. I check my pocket and my keys are still there. No phone, though. I guess I threw it at that stalker along with everything else. I sneak back to my house, jump into my car, and nope the fuck out. I head to work and tell them what's happened and call the cops. The cops head to my house and send others to my work. The stalker guy was gone when they turn up. They searched the house and found out he had been living in my crawl space. I'm paranoid that's what all those doors and lights and misplaced things were about. I pack up whatever I can to fit in my car while the cops are still there, and I drive. I haven't been back since. I moved states and got a new everything. I have been in touch with the police since, and they're reporting that while they have his photo from security footage, they haven't been able to track him down yet. That means he's still out there somewhere, and I have no idea how he tracked me down. I probably won't update this again, but I just wanted to thank everyone for their support. It means a lot. This happened six or so years ago, when I was 16 years old. I didn't even really realize how unnerving this all was until fairly recently. When I was 15 to 16 years old, I went through a phase where I would constantly get hair extensions put in. I had a favorite salon that I always went to as well. The two ladies there were lovely and would always compliment me on my appearance. Stuff like, you are so pretty girl, do you have a boyfriend? I cannot believe you're only 15. To which I felt absolutely flattered. However, after my 6th or 7th appointment there, they started asking more specifically about why I was single and if I was interested in having a boyfriend. I would always reply with something like, yeah, when the right one comes along. During one specific appointment, they started chatting about me being single again. This time, one of the ladies started talking about her brother. She said that he lived in Africa, but he would absolutely love me and I should go meet him one day. I asked her how old this guy was, 
and she said he was in his early 20s. Mind you, I was 15. Due to the age gap and the fact my older brother would have killed me for even talking to a guy a year above me, I politely told her I was not interested in meeting her brother, but thanks for the offer. She got very visibly upset and said, Why? Come on, he'll look after you. Let him take you back to Africa and he'll make you the African queen. I just shook it off because they were always so nice to me, and I assumed that she must be joking around. I remember telling a few friends about it and having a laugh. They joked about how I should have taken the offer. It was soon forgotten. Fast forward an entire two years. I was around 17 years old at this point and had just gotten my driver's license. It had been a long while since I had hair extensions put in, and I thought that I would treat myself to change up my look. Of course, I also wanted to see my old stylists for a brief catch-up. I went to the salon and it went quite smoothly. I went from short hair to long hair in a matter of two hours and I was on my way. Before I left, one of the ladies asked if I wanted to come back tomorrow to try out their new hair oil serum for free. So of course I said yes. Nothing is free in this life though. And sadly, I was drawn in like a moth to a bright light. I went in the next day super keen for this experimental oil because my real hair was quite damaged. When I arrived, there was a man in the salon too. I assumed it must be their friend. I didn't think too much about it and sat down to get this free serum. The whole time though, this man was glaring daggers at me. And when I say glaring, I mean glaring. He didn't say a single word the entire time, but just stared at me and did a strange giggle every time I said anything. The vibes were not sitting well with me. After they finished, I just wanted to leave, so I gathered up my things, said thank you very much, and good day, ladies and sir. One of them stopped me on my way out, though, and said, This is my brother I was telling you about back then. Oh. Let him walk you to your car. Unfortunately, my car was parked ten minutes away, and I absolutely did not want this stranger walking with me for 10 whole minutes, so of course I declined. They kept trying to insist, to which I kept declining. I said, no, 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 no thank you. I do not need nor want your brother to walk me to my car. I left the salon and started walking. However, I soon realized I was not alone. The brother was following two meters behind me. Where the salon was located, it was practically almost an alleyway leading into a car park, leading into the back streets. I turned around and told him that I really did not need him to walk me there. I was very capable by myself. His reply was short and to the point. No, I come with you. Uh, okay. I walked briskly all the way to where my car was. Not a single word was said between us. He just walked two meters behind me. Sometimes he would catch up and walk next to me just staring. This went on for the full 10 minutes. I felt so awkward and uncomfortable and also started to get scared as it was getting quite dark and nobody else was around. When I was near my car, I finally had enough of this grown ass man. So I turned around and said, please stop following me. Thank you for walking with me, but my car is right here. So bye. Finally, he started talking though. Where is your boyfriend? Me, being an incredibly smart woman of age 17, said almost immediately, I don't have a boyfriend. Dumb. What he did and said next, I'll never forget. There was an elevator right where we were standing that went to the upper level car park. He summoned the elevator, which I thought was quite strange. When it reached us, he looked me straight in the eye and said, You need to come home with me or I'll make you my African queen. He grabbed my arm quite forcefully and started trying to drag me into the elevator with him. I obviously started screaming and fight mode kicked in. He was a lot stronger than me as he was a male in his late twenties and I was still this small little 17 year old with a fresh weave. But boy, you best believe your girl can scream. My heart was in my throat. I felt like I was in a movie and I genuinely started bracing for assault in this elevator. 
Luckily, an amazing gentleman who must have just been in the car park somewhere heard me screaming and ran over, which made the salon lady's brother let go of me and absolutely leg it. He ran away so quickly. Thank you to the kind man who saved me that day. I don't know what would have happened if he managed to drag me into that elevator. And also to the salon ladies and their brother. Let's never meet again. And for the 100th time, thank you, but no. I do not want to be the African queen. This happened in May of 2015 in California, which will help those of you who are familiar. I had graduated college in June of 2014, moved back into my old hometown, and started a consulting company with my boyfriend, which was going very well. We had just finished a contract in the Bay Area, and were beginning a new one about eight hours south in Torrance. He moved down there first to start setting up, while I took care of loose ends at our closing contract before moving down to meet him. The day comes and I pack my car and head south down the I-5. For the uninitiated, it's a straight highway with little in the way of scenery, aside from the occasional strip mall. Its monotony has a reputation for putting drivers to sleep at the wheel. I pass a strip mall with gas and a fast food joint and decide to fill up my car and my stomach. I go to park in the food venue's parking lot, but it's completely full, so I park across the street at a hotel, which at the time I didn't think anything of. I go inside and eat my meal, then cross the street to get back to my car. I'm well into the hotel parking lot when a pickup truck pulls down the aisle, cuts off my path and stops, with the passenger side facing me. The driver was alone, a clean-cut white male in his mid-thirties, I don't really remember anything about him except that he looked very generic and buttoned up. The way he pulled in front of me to block my path didn't initially set off alarm bells, as he had done it in a pretty organic way. He rolled his windows down, and this dialogue followed. Excuse me, miss, but could you please tell me where the grocery store in town is? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not from here, so I couldn't say. Oh? Where are you from? Uh, good question. I don't know, not here though. I didn't say that to be rude. I just moved through so many cities at that point and was on my way to a new one, so I wasn't sure really how to answer that question. He laughed and made a joke, then asked me where I was headed. I mentioned that I was in the process of moving. I will say that he was very charismatic and at this point I just thought he was trying to flirt with me. If I hadn't been so exhausted or in a relationship on another day, it just might have worked. He makes another comment about how unpleasant moving can be and then gives a warm chuckle and extends his hand to shake mine. Well, I'm glad I got to meet you. I'm Scott, by the way. If you recall, the truck was in front of me with the passenger side facing me. I actually took a step forward to grab his hand, then got the delayed response of every alarm bell that should have gone off earlier. 1. I'm in a hotel parking lot. 2. He just asked me a question that established I don't know where I am. 3. Another question that established I'm alone. And 4. Another that established I'm not expected at my destination for many more hours. The thing that connected all these synapses? When he extended his hand to me, he didn't make even the faintest effort to make it accessible at all. He didn't lean over the seat or move toward me in any way. Instead, his hand was hovering comfortably over the center console, waiting for me to grasp it, which in order to do so, I would have had to lean well into the car. Again, I had already taken a step forward towards him and begun to raise my hand to take his, when these sirens went off. I rocked backward to where I was standing. I remember looking into his eyes for what felt like forever, feeling everything click into place while also half convinced my imagination was just running wild. His hand was still waiting steadily. I lowered mine and felt my eyes narrow slightly with suspicion. I'm going to walk away from your car now, Scott. Boom. The truck burns rubber, thick gray smoke shooting out as the guy guns it out of the hotel lot at 100 miles per hour. He must have slammed it. Regrettably smart on his end. 
because I didn't have the license number or anything to offer to the police later. In the immediate minutes following the event, I felt very relieved, but I hadn't really processed the full weight of what just happened. Unfortunately for me, I had many more hours to think back and analyze the whole interaction to shreds. The car was somewhat lifted. There could have easily been another person, or even two or three other people hiding inside. Would he have pulled me in? Would he have injected me with something? My mind just kept creating all these scenarios where I wake up hours later, and nobody would even know where in my drive I went missing, or possibly even notice for most of the day. I still get creeped out thinking about how close I came to taking his hand, and how fortunate I was that I didn't allow my reaction to be driven by manners, as criminals often take advantage of. To give you some context, I'm 20 years old. I live in the suburbs in a small residence of six houses. My gate is very, very often broken, including today, which means that 80% of the time it's wide open. Anyone can get into the small courtyard. My house has one floor and there are four bedrooms including mine. Downstairs, there's a guest bedroom which is used as a treatment room because I have big health problems. This is where all the equipment, medicines, like morphine and doses that could kill an average person, and where the care takes place as well. I have a dog and I'm very, very close to him. He's pretty much my life. He feels everything to the point of feeling my epileptic seizures before they happen sometimes, even recognizing the nurses who are arriving. He recognizes them by the sound of their tires as they arrive in the yard. He never barks, except when there is a problem. Finally, to let you know, a nurse spends four to five times a day to give me care at home, including infusions. This is quite important to the story. That morning, like every morning, my nurse arrived at 8 a.m. For the rest of the story, I'll call her Sandra. She took care of me as usual. That is to say, an infusion of painkillers, replacing the antibiotic diffusers, giving me a blood test, and remaking the cassette of my morphine pump. We usually chat about everything and nothing all at once. She tells me stories of different patients during my treatments. These nurses are an integral part of my life. They've looked over me for over six years now. She leaves after 40 minutes and says, See you later. I'm sure I'll be a little bit late, but don't worry. That day, I had a medical appointment in the morning, and I was alone all day because my parents were working, except, of course, the nurses passing by every four hours or so. Once back from my meeting, I sat on my sofa with my dog waiting for my nurse to arrive. After a while, I heard the tire noises pulling up. I got up because I thought it must be my nurse, but the dog started to growl behind the door. I took a look at the time, 11.50 a.m. I told myself it was a little bit early, but sometimes instead of coming after, my nurse exchanged me with the patient that was supposed to come before. I hear knocking. Surprised, I go to open it. I see a woman standing there who I had never seen before. Hello, are you my name? I'm Camille, a third-year nursing student. Your nurse is going to be a bit late today, so she told me to come and start preparing everything. She'll arrive not long after, so don't worry at all. I wasn't really wary at all. I was used to students coming by. I was just a little bit surprised that Sandra didn't warn me. Usually, she would tell me every time in the morning when they were coming, or send me a message later in the evening before. She never leaves a student alone when it's the first time we meet each other either. I told myself she must have just forgotten to tell me. I bring this woman in and show her the way to the treatment room. I take out the things for treatment while she washes her hands. My dog is acting real weird though. He growls at her as soon as she approaches me and then turns around to me. I was so embarrassed that I left him in the living room and closed the door for him to be quiet. I didn't really care what she did. I just let her do it since I was on the phone at the moment. She began to put the IV on the infusion stand and took a syringe. Normally, we rinse my central catheter with a syringe of Fi serum already made. You just have to open the packaging. 
I see it's not a pre-made syringe, but a syringe she had just prepared. I look up and see that the ampules for my treatments are intact and have not been opened either. Yet before, I had heard the sound of ampules breaking. I was starting to think this was very weird. She started to approach me to inject this mystery syringe when I got a message from my real nurse. I'll be there in five minutes. You can start pulling out the material now. Oh my god, my blood had only run for one spin. I got up and said, I, I have to go to the bathroom. I'll be back in a bit. I ran and locked myself in the downstairs toilet. The whole time my dog was barking and growling. When I opened the door, he followed me straight up so we were both in the toilet together. I sent a message to my nurse. Your student Camille is here already. She already prepared everything. She replied, Who? I started crying in the toilet and was really, really scared. Camille came and called through the door. Hey, is everything okay in there? I think she could see I was staying an abnormally long time. Yeah, I I'm almost finished. Then I heard my front door slam shut. Two minutes later, I heard it open again, but this time it was my nurse. I came out of the toilet crying. She asked me to explain what had happened. I told her about everything and showed her to the treatment room. We called the police. They came, examined everything, took samples as well. The syringe and the rest of the things that Camille had prepared. The test results were received a few days after receiving the products in the syringe and the infusion. What she had put into the syringe was a paralyzing agent. She had put a dose that could have paralyzed a man of 120 kilograms or more, and I'm only 40. In the IV it was a medicine to lower the heart rate, but so concentrated it would have stopped anyone's heart. Today, we still don't know who this Camille was, and luckily I never heard from her again after. I should also specify that she stole all my opioids, but not other things like my tablet which was on the bed, or my computer which was just sitting in the living room. In retrospect, I realized my dog had sensed this person didn't want me to be well. I tell myself I should have watched her, because she was just a student, and my treatments are not paracetamol. I kept wondering what could have happened if I hadn't looked at my phone. I'll give you any updates if I ever have them, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate. Thanks for reading, and have a good day. This happened a few days ago, and I'm still pretty shaken up about it. I only just thought to post it, so here goes. On Friday afternoon, I got a call from my friend named Sarah, asking if I wanted to meet her and another friend named Lisa at Dunkin' Donuts, as we hadn't seen one another in quite a while. Dunkin' Donuts is a 15-minute walk from my house, so I decided I would walk. Besides, the weather was fine. I got to Dunkin' Donuts and found where Sarah and Lisa were sat and went to join them. As we were chatting, I noticed that my sister Elena was sat at a table in the corner of the room with her friend Jess. For some context, my sister and her friend are both 18. My sister still lives with my parents, whereas I live alone. I excused myself from the table for a moment and went over to Elena and Jess's. They were sat at a table with three seats, so I sat down with them and said hi. They both jumped a little bit like they were really startled, but then looked more relieved than anything to see me. Immediately, Elena leaned in and whispered to me, Don't look now, but that guy in the blue shirt? I think he's been following Jess and I. I glanced over and saw a middle-aged man sat at a table, facing slightly away from us. He's walked past our table a good five times in the past 20 minutes to go to the bathroom, but he always walks slower when he passes by us, she continued. I told them they were most likely being paranoid, and there was nothing to worry about, but for their peace of mind, I offered to leave with them so they wouldn't feel as worried. I walked back over to my table and explained the situation to Sarah and Lisa. Both of them laughed it off and assumed my sister was just being paranoid. Literally, about a minute later though, I saw that same man get up from his seat and walk toward the bathroom. My eyes followed him, and sure enough, he walked extremely slowly past Elena and Jess, 
In fact, it was almost comical how obvious he became. Both of them looked in my direction, and I nodded to show them that now that I had seen him, I believed them. About five minutes later, I went to the toilets myself. On my way, I passed Elena and Jess and told them I was ready to go whenever they were. They both agreed that they wanted to leave right now. I told them I was going to go to the bathroom for a moment, and we could leave after I had done my business. Elena had come in her car, so she was going to give me a lift back. I went into the toilet stall, did my business, washed my hands. I was walking down the corridor back to the main eating area when Elena and Jess rushed into the corridor. I asked them what was wrong. They explained that another man had joined that strange creeper and the men were both pointing and staring at them, so they rightfully felt unsafe. We walked back into the eating area. I put my money on our table and explained to Lisa and Sarah that I was taking off and I would explain what was going on fully when we got home. We all got into Elena's car and left those creeps in the car's rear view mirror. After a two minute drive, we reached my house. Just then, I remembered that I had been meaning to return something I had borrowed from my mother, so I asked if Elena could drive me to my parents' house, as she was going there anyway. I jumped out of the car to get what I needed, when suddenly my phone rang. It was Elena. She explained that a car had just driven past and pulled into a driveway. She said the driver of the vehicle was that same creep from Dunkin' Donuts. I took a peek out my window, and sure enough, there was a car which didn't belong to the owner of the house, parked right on their driveway. I ushered the girls into my home and locked the door. I instructed Elena to take a photo of the car and its license plate, while telling Jess to call 911. She gave the operator more information than I could. Elena took the photos and we sort of gathered around Jess as she was speaking to the operator. She had finished telling the story, and I heard the operator assure us the police would be at my house soon. Just a few minutes later, there was a loud knock at the front door, followed by a loud voice shouting, It's the police! We all breathed a sigh of relief as I went to open the door. Jess told the operator the police were there and went to hang up. I was just in the process of unlocking the door when I thought to look through the peephole at the top. I peered through, but what I saw was not a police officer. It was the same man. I froze in fear and didn't know what to say. We, we didn't call the police! I managed to shout back at the man through the door. Elena and Jess were both very confused as to why I was doing this. Uh, we had a call, sir? The man shouted back. You must have the wrong address. I informed the girls it was the creep at the door and not an officer. Both were rightfully shocked and extremely scared, as was I. I was about to tell Jess to call the police again, until I heard the sirens. The man began to panic. Sir, you have to let me in right now. This time I didn't answer. He was pounding on the door. His commands for me to let him in turned into pleading and begging. I heard the police car pull up and some commotion outside. An actual officer then knocked on the door, and I let him in. And yes, I did check the peephole first. The police officers took the man into custody, while another police officer took Elena and Jess into the dining room for some brief questioning. I called my parents, and Jess called hers. Both were here extremely quickly once we told them what had happened. The man was found with a kitchen knife on his person and some other weapons in the car. Who knows what could have happened if I hadn't had the instinct to look through the peephole first. Both my sister and her friend are fine, although they are shaken up after the whole incident. So I, 20 and female, lived in a shady-as-hell apartment complex in an otherwise rich suburban area for three years, and I have a hell of a lot of stories that could fit here. But this one is about a neighbor I'll call Bob. A little bit of backstory. Me, 18 at the time, and my then 16-year-old sister used to babysit all of the neighborhood kids. These kids considered us their friends. It even got to the point where they seemed to have a radar of whenever me and my sister went outside. They'd come out and talk to us, and we'd let them ride our skateboards and such in the parking lot. The kids were all ages 8 through 13. 
so one day we were outside with them, when we were suddenly joined by a stranger. He stood between us and our car, towering over us. He introduced himself and asked us to sign this petition he made up. We did, just being friendly. Then he asked us how old we were. I thought maybe he was a fellow teenager that perhaps looked just a bit older, or maybe he was just an awkward adult, so I told him I was 18. Of course, the very next question was if I wanted to go out with him, right in front of my mom and the other kids' moms as well. I awkwardly declined, but he continued talking about how he thought me and my sister were in middle school. Apparently, he was also 28. Eventually, he just kind of wandered away and asked someone else to sign his petition. A few days later, he knocked at our door after asking the neighbor for the address. He had a bag of what he said was chicken and wanted us to go eat it with him at the park. We declined and said we had schoolwork to do. He walked away, mumbling and grumbling about how antisocial everyone was. Later, we looked out our window and saw him playing baseball with two small girls. He kept physically moving their arms to different positions, even though they were clearly shrugging away from him. The next day, one of the little kids runs right up to me. I'll call her Maddie. She was eight. She had just gotten a new pair of Heelys and wanted to show off and have me help her with them. I was holding her hand and guiding her along when Bob appeared and said he could help better. Maddie said no, but he insisted. He actually pushed me out of the way and reached for Maddie, holding her tightly around the upper chest area. Her grandma was there too and flipped out. He just sort of meandered away. The next day, Maddie was freaking out, saying Bob had been sitting on her porch when she left for school that morning. Her parents found out, and as they walked outside, he let himself in. He went into their kitchen and started making orange chicken. We later found out another neighbor had a similar story as well. Another time, we were helping a family move. They had a two-year-old son. The garages are in a triangle shape to the road, almost like a roundabout. There's a flat patch of grass behind him. Well, here comes Bob to help us. He criticized the way we packed things and didn't help until our neighbor politely asked him to leave. Well, he left the garage, but instead of actually leaving, he asked the two-year-old if he wanted to go off and play. When the kid said no, it made him angry. He picked up the kid to play, and the kid slapped him. He asked if the kid wanted to go behind the garages now. The kid's mom hadn't noticed yet, so I went with them and guided the kid back to his mom. The climax of this story is when my sister and I went on a walk with our 17-year-old friend and her other friend. Maddie ran up to us and wanted to come along. So here we are, starting our walk when Bob comes out. He sees our friend and immediately asks how old she is and how much she weighs because she's so skinny. He asks where we're going, too. My friend tells him we're going for ice cream on a girl's trip. He got real mad and stomped away. We continued our walk, but halfway through, I got this weird feeling. So I looked behind us. Bob is sprinting towards us. He yells at us for hiding from him, while also telling Maddie how pretty she is. An older neighbor saw this and immediately asked what was going on. He told the man we were being mean, and he needed to go write a song about us or something. He left, but later we saw him sitting at the park. When he saw us, he instantly came running again. We stop, and he asks us which one of us is over 18. Maddie's dad was there at this point, and told him we weren't interested in him. He exploded, telling the dad to fuck himself and various other rude things and expletives, also calling me a bitch. Maddie was crying, and the neighbor who saw us before rushed over to check on us since he'd seen Bob running. Bob went inside muttering to himself. For a few weeks, we didn't see him. A single dad and his five-year-old daughter moved in, and we were introducing ourselves to them. My mom kind of tipped him off that there was someone in our building who was a little bit off, especially around Maddie. The dad said he'd seen someone like that giving candy to kids at the pool while they seemed uncomfortable. Here comes Bob as if on cue. He immediately tells the girl in front of her dad that she looks like a movie star, and how pretty she is. He has to take her off and play with her, but the dad says no of course and they go inside. Turns out they were next door neighbors. 
We still didn't see him much, but the other neighbors were telling us all kinds of horrible stories about him. There was a woman who was alone most of the day with her two kids under five, who told us he stared and watched her whenever she went to and from her car. Maddie's parents continued to see him watching her, too. Then one day, again, we're babysitting, and here he comes, only this time he's swinging some nunchucks. Maddie screamed and hid in our car. He strolls over, nunchucks in hand, and starts talking to us all casual, but then he starts looking around. Where's Maddie? We told him she wasn't here, and he seemed to walk away. By then, most of the kids were afraid to go outside whenever they saw him. He had a habit of wandering around the complex. We could tell by his height and lanky gait. A few times, we'd see Bob with his dad. Those times, neither even glanced at us. Then one day, he just stopped showing up. We'd still see his dad and brother come in and out all the time, but we'd never see him. We only saw him again a year later, and it was only for one day near Christmas. Then he disappeared altogether. I really don't know what happened to him but it was just one of those weird experiences with neighbors in the three years we lived there. Maybe I'll post the stories of a chick that wanted to kill her parents because she was a witch, or the old man that bit children next, if you want to hear them. Okay, so I have quite a few crazy stories. I'm not sure why, but a lot of crazy stuff has happened to me in the past, but this experience is one that I really don't like to talk about. It's just very unsettling and uncomfortable, but I feel like sharing it might do some good. So, let me begin. Okay, so for starters, if you don't know what Club Penguin is, it was a virtual world where you played as a penguin. You could chat with people from all over the world. Customize your penguin, including changing its color, buying its clothes, decorating its house, play games, do missions, and you even had pets you could take care of. It was actually a pretty cool game, but definitely not as safe for kids as its advertisements made it out to be. Now don't get me wrong, it had chat filters, loads of warnings on the site about not sharing personal info, reporting and blocking options, and all that good safety jazz. And of course, there was also an age limit. But with all that being said, I'll never understand how people develop games like this and think that everything is going to be just peachy. Kids are not stupid. They know how to get around safety features and more importantly, adults know how to take advantage of it as well. This is a story of how I was taken advantage of by an adult posing as a child on Club Penguin. Obviously, I was very young when all this happened. I don't remember exact digits, but I want to say I was about 7 or 8 years old. I had this very basic Club Penguin account with a random name, and I had lots of friends on there. I was a bit of a loner in school, only having about one or two friends that weren't even in most of my classes. Like most kids, I made up for this lack of socialization online. I tried to make friends with anyone I could that I found interesting. Well, one day, I met this black penguin. He had a pretty generic name like Cool Dude or something with a bunch of numbers after it. He was really interesting, though. He said he was my age, and then he liked a lot of the same things I did. We'd often spend time shopping for our penguins together or decorating our igloo houses while chatting up a storm about anything. TV shows, books, music, school. We talked for about two weeks and eventually I told him my first name. Stupid, I know. After I told him my name, he asked me if I had a phone, or if I had a Facebook. At the time, I didn't, so he said we could just keep talking on Club Penguin instead. Over time, though, I eventually stopped going online as often, and he'd tell me he missed talking to me whenever I came on. Lots of things like that. Eventually, there was a time period where I didn't get on for almost two weeks or so, I should mention that at the time, being so young, I didn't write emails or even check my email, so my parents and my older brother kept track of it for me. Well, one day, my brother discovered that a guy was emailing me and asked who this guy was. I looked at the emails and recognized the username as the same one the boy had had on his Club Penguin account. I told my brother he was a friend of mine I'd met on Club Penguin. He said I shouldn't be giving out my email like that 
because I didn't know who this person could really be. I tried to tell my brother that I hadn't ever given out my email to anyone, but he didn't believe me at the time and just told me it was okay but not to do it again. He then blocked the man's email. I logged on to Club Penguin the next day, and the boy never mentioned the email, so neither did I. We just hung out and chatted like always. Another week went by. My brother came in my room to check my computer like he always did, but this time was different. My brother immediately got quite tense and told me to leave the room for some reason, and told me to go get my mom as well. Later in life, I found out this boy was not a boy at all, but a man in his 30s or 40s. My parents believe he had hacked my Club Penguin account to get my email, so he could start sending me nude photos of himself. My inbox was flooded with pictures of him fully exposed, and messages saying that he loved me, and he wanted to find me in person. I felt violated when I found out, and to this day it still bothers me to even think about it. I have lots of creepy encounters during my travels, but I'll start with the most recent one. This is fairly long, as I have two creepy encounters, one right after the other. For clarification, I'm Asian with very distinct Asian features. Five foot, one inches small, and in my twenties. Last year, I went to Egypt with a big group of about 40 people. For one night, we stayed at this beautiful villa-styled hotel, right on top of the mountains. The layout for this particular hotel is there was a very long pool in the middle, surrounded by small villas with about 20 rooms per villa. Our group got assigned to the furthest one from the lobby. It was around 10pm when I decided to go out for a walk to watch the stars and all. My grandma, who I was sharing the room with, was very tired so she went to sleep early and I went out by myself. I walked around the pool, enjoyed the weather and the stars, and sat on one of the benches by the poolside. It was then that I noticed one of the hotel staff, a bag porter who had helped with our luggage when we checked in, approaching me. I thought nothing of it, but he came by and made small talk. I attributed this to him trying to be friendly and courteous to the guests. He asked where we came from, and I answered quite politely. What he said next gave me the creeps, though. He said his friend was actually looking for a wife from my country. Uh, okay, dude. I laughed it off and lied that I was married. He asked where my husband was. I kinda panicked and told him my non-existent husband got left behind because he had to work. Immediately, he took out his phone to call someone, but I guess the person he was calling was not picking up. He told me to wait there, but my spidey senses were tingling on overdrive. I had two options. Walk back to the villa as quickly as possible, but risk letting this man know the room where I was staying at with my grandma. Or walk toward the well-lighted lobby area, hoping there were people from my group still there. I stood up and started to walk quite quickly to the lobby. The man was still trying to reach someone on his phone, and tried to call after me, but I waved goodbye and hurried off. When I got to the lobby, I was relieved to see our tour leader, our Egyptian tour guide, and three ladies from our group still there. No more creepy hotel staff. Or so I thought. In the hotel lobby, they had a bunch of souvenir shops set up. One of the ladies I was close with, B, was browsing inside the papyrus souvenir shop. Our guide warned us beforehand that the papyrus painting they sell at this hotel is a fake or generally just a low-quality tourist trap souvenir, so I went inside the shop to tell B about that, just in case she forgot. Inside were me and two salesmen, as well as B. One of them was standing near the door, and blocking the only means of exit. B asked for my opinion between two paintings, and the salesman in front of us told us that these paintings had a different pattern show up that glows in the dark. He asked us if we wanted to see it, I firmly said no before anyone else could answer. I had had enough for the day and just wanted to go back to our room. However, this persistent salesman said something to this other man standing behind us, who then proceeded to close the door and turn off the lights. Fuck. 
Maybe I'm just paranoid, but I really did not like the idea of being in the pitch dark with two men I did not know. I could also sense B was starting to panic as well, and she grabbed onto my wrist. Like an angel in disguise, though, the door suddenly opened from the outside. It was B's aunt who had been in the lobby with our tour guide. She shouted at us and asked what we were doing, then motioned for us to come out quickly. I swear, I don't know what they would have done if B's aunt didn't open the door at that time. She made a fuss over it and the rest of the group walked back to the villa together with our tour leader. On the way back, B's aunt asked us if anything had happened. If our phones and wallets were still with us, all that jazz. We checked our belongings and everything was still fine. No one followed us back to the villa, so I was happy that we were also checking out the next morning. This is not meant to generalize or talk ill of a country, by the way. It just happened to happen in Egypt. It doesn't mean that Egyptians are creepy, but these hotel staff we encountered, regardless of nationality, acted very creepy and unprofessional. It didn't matter which country they're from. Their actions are what led me to say I'd rather not meet them again. Hello. For context, I'm a 28-year-old blonde woman, and I look around 18 to 22 or so I'm told. I recently went back to college for human resources, so I was on the go train at 1pm on a Monday to get to a 3pm class. The train comes from outside the city, and it's super dead during the day when it's not rush hour. I hop onto this train and walked upstairs, but decided to go to the middle area. There's a middle area right next to a bathroom, because someone was humming and I thought it was quite annoying. The washroom door was closed the whole time. I didn't think anyone was in there. I was alone in this middle area with no one around me. I'm sitting with my jacket off drinking tea out of a bunny mug with my backpack right across from me. I was completely comfortable because the GO train is typically a very calm ride. All of a sudden though, a man pops out of the bathroom after about 5 minutes of me just sitting there. He was around 22 years old and had white fine line scars in the shape of a heart and a 3D cube on his face. He put his hands on my backpack. I assumed he was going to try to mug me. I thought I was going to punch him in the throat and run because this wasn't my first attempted mugging and I've never been successfully mugged. My body froze though because his first words were, I'm gonna kill my father tonight and I'm gonna make you help me. He obviously didn't want my debit card. He wanted to hurt me. I currently work in mental health and I'm used to working with people with homicidal thoughts. I don't scare easily when someone says their voices say to kill me because I feel like I have all the resources I need and the rapport with my own people. I didn't know this man though. Immediately, I knew this wasn't just thoughts or a case of being lonely and talking to random strangers. He was not seeking help from me. I knew I needed to leave, but he moved his legs to block me in. I heard my voice shaking as I said, It sounds like you're going through a lot right now. I'm sorry to hear you're upset with your dad. Why don't you tell me about it? I grabbed my backpack. I knew I looked terrified because I just knew this was not good. No, you're fucking not. Because women like you fucking sleep with my dad, you filthy bitch. He gets closer and corners me into the seat. He says he's gonna force me to help him kill his dad with a knife tonight because he's pretty tired of a woman like me, always ignoring him but fucking his dad. He keeps asking me why I do stuff like that. I felt terrified. I realized we were only two feet away from the washroom. I was scared he was going to try and make me go in there. My body was just frozen. His face gets right up into mine. I scream at the top of my lungs for help. Honestly, I didn't even recognize my own voice. I sounded so terrified. Luckily, four random people from the train came running to help. One man, two young women, and one middle-aged woman. The man immediately said, Are you okay, miss? The guy across from me put his legs down. He starts saying I'm screaming and calling for help because I'm a vain woman. We're all vain and cruel, and all I want is someone pretty, not like him, as he motions to his scars. 
I bolted upstairs with the help from the others, and I couldn't even talk for a full minute. My hands were shaking. I'd been in some scary situations before, but I was completely comfortable with this commute, not on guard like I am at work. The guy who came to help me saw the guy was getting even more mad and still yelling. I honestly don't remember what. He told me to run toward the customer service train, and he'd make sure the guy didn't follow me. We pressed the yellow security strip before I got up and went. The train started beeping, but there was no security to come. The guy who came to help me found me later when the train stopped. He told me he had strolled off the train like nothing happened. The two young girls who came with me had their phones though and took a lot of pictures of him walking away and gave them to the police. I walked to the customer service train. The police came but the man was already long gone. They talked to me for a few minutes and said they knew who he was because of the scars on his face. He had apparently done something similar yesterday and they thought he had severe mental issues, as if it didn't matter what happened. In all honesty, the police officer didn't seem very interested in talking to me. They asked if I saw his knife. I said no, but it didn't surprise me. The way he spoke had been the confidence of a man with a weapon. They obviously didn't care what I thought he could have had. They explained he had slapped another woman on the train, and someone even saw him pull a knife out at some point. Someone called the cops before we even pressed the emergency strip, but the customer service train guy didn't know that. He only knew my story because no one else pressed it and I came running to him. I just want to say that someone with mental illness can be homicidal, but it's not necessarily a symptom of who they are as a person. It's just a sign of how unwell they are in that moment. Not all people with mental illness have homicidal thoughts or are violent at all. I know very kind and wonderful people who have homicidal thoughts sometimes, when they go through big life transitions. Those kind of people are not the ones that scare me. Maybe this man might have had some mental issues, but this guy scared me to my bones, and I'm glad the people came running to help me when I called for help. My gut tells me he would have done something horrible to me if I hadn't started screaming. I sincerely hope if he had mental health issues that they took him to a hospital so he's not just around roaming free. The worst part is I saw a young lady around 18 years old crying on the train the next day. I overheard her saying she cried and hid in the washroom the entire train ride because a man had scared her when she got on and she had to call her parents to come pick her up. I had no clue if it's the same guy, but I felt like it was probable and it bothers me that he's bothering any woman, but especially young girls who might be too scared to know to scream. It's been a few months since then and the police never contacted me on if they caught him. He never actually touched me, so I guess maybe to them it wasn't serious enough to look into. It made me permanently anxious on my commute though, and I never sit alone or take my jacket off anymore. I just never can really be comfortable on the train. Before we start, remember kids, stranger danger. If you don't know them, don't give them the time of day. This was about 15 years ago or so. My parents had gone out for a nice dinner for their anniversary and decided that I was old enough and responsible enough to be left alone, at least just for a few hours on a weeknight. I was almost nine at the time and we owned a fairly protective dog as well. So, what could possibly go wrong? They leave and tell me to lock up and call if anything happens. I do so and I immediately proceed to party around the house like a rock star. Because, dude, I had the whole dang house to myself and I could do whatever I wanted. Hell to the yeah. About halfway through a Sailor Moon marathon, I suddenly get a knock at the door. I was confused as all get out because it had only been about two hours and they had said they wouldn't be back until around 10 anyway. I guessed Mama had left something she needed behind again and swung around to grab it. My front door is a system of two doors, a super old thick wooden one, from the house being originally built in the 30s, and then outside of that a screen door. My dog was raising absolute hell at the front door. 
I pulled her back a bit to try and calm her down, because she had a tendency to be very reactive to almost any noise. Well, it was not my mom at the door. It was some middle-aged man I'd never seen before in my life. Papa O was now basically feral, so I kept the screen door firmly closed and a hand on her collar. I asked the man what he wanted. He started on in this weird convoluted story about how he had two young twin daughters and they'd gotten into a fight and one of them had run away. This man claimed that he believed his daughter was now hiding in my house and would like to come inside to look for her. I tell him immediately there is no such girl here. Why would he even think she would be here in the first place? He starts going in on this story about how this was the house they first lived in and how it's the one she was born in. It was like a safe place for her or something and would likely be the most likely place she would run away to as it was really the only other place she knows. I had felt kind of weird at first when I opened the door slightly and heard this dude's story and this stuff was absolutely not helping his cause but now I definitely knew something shitty was about to go down. I, in no uncertain terms, informed the guy he must have the wrong house, because this house was built and has been lived in by my family since its very initial construction. My dad was born in this house, and after my mom and dad told his parents that they were pregnant with my older sister, they gave it to them as a present to begin their new family. He must be mistaken because I knew all of this to be fact. Hell, there were pictures less than 10 feet away from me on the wall of my dad and uncle playing in the front yard in the late 70s. By now, my dog was growling like crazy, and the dude was getting extremely agitated. He insists that I have no idea what I'm talking about. If I would just give him a few minutes to search for his daughter, he could be on his way right away. The latch on the screen door was broken at the time, and I was putting all my strength into holding my dog from the door. He opened the screen door with one hand, and the other reached for my closest arm. All of a sudden, that crazy cocker goes fucking ballistic. She used all her strength to lunge at him, grabbed a hold of his hand, and bit down fiercely. Now the man was yelling and confused. He pushed back against the screen door and slammed it shut to get my dog off of him. Sadie got pushed back inside, but she was still raging away. I quickly slammed the front door and locked it, and chained it tight. I ran around the house and made sure all the other doors and windows were locked, and then hunkered down in the bathroom, hyperventilating. I waited about 15 minutes until Sadie's growling had calmed some. I check outside. No man or his car. Both were now long gone. I call my parents and tell them they need to come home right now, please. When they get home, I recount the whole story. My dad goes to check the front door, and sure enough, on the screen door jam and siding of the house was a large handprint of blood. Sadie was treated like a queen and got a whole steak for her to eat that weekend. When I was 15, I was in a really bad mental headspace. With that being said, I was depressed, lonely, and desperate for anyone's attention. So, against my better judgment, I made an account on Plenty of Fish. I understand that I put myself in a dangerous position for predators, but I also understand that any man who I told my age to should have just reported my account and not spoken to me. But, after swiping left and right for about an hour, I met a man who I'll call Red. Red was 26, a father of two beautiful toddlers and a Puerto Rican native who had recently moved to Florida. He spoke a fair bit of English and had this charm to him whenever he spoke. When I told him my age, it's scary now to think about just how okay he was with it. He simply told me that we wouldn't have sexual relations and our other interactions would be innocent. We talked for a few months before talking eventually about meeting up. When I talked to Red, I felt very happy, whole, like I finally had someone to support me. The first few times we met up, it was fine. We went to the outlets, Disney Springs, the movies. He was a perfect gentleman, held my hand, opened doors for me, 
and most importantly kept his hands off me. Eventually we did kiss a bit, but nothing too intense. About six months into our relationship though, I turned 16, and I invited him to my house, through means of sneaking in through my window of course, and he agreed. We were just hanging out watching a movie, when he kissed me in a way he never had before, in a way I'd never been kissed before. It was surprising, and without having to be said, very overwhelming. I suddenly got very scared. It finally hit me in that moment that this guy was a full-grown man and I was just a child. I got off my bed and told him he had to leave. His face immediately contorted into anger, and he stepped toward me, trying to convince me through gritted teeth not to force him to go. He reached out to grab my shoulders, and out of instinct I shoved his chest to make him back off, only for a very harsh shove to be returned. A sudden hot pain overwhelmed me, spreading from the back of my head and down the rest of my body. Then everything went black. The next thing I knew, I was hearing a blood-curdling scream. Hazed out and too weak to open my eyes fully, I could just barely make out my mom. I felt this wetness on my head, and my body felt so cold. It was just as I began to gather that something was very wrong, that I lost consciousness once again. The following time that I awoke was in a hospital bed. My head was pounding like crazy and aching in the back. I reached up to hazily feel where the pain was coming from, and my fingertips grazed a row of staples on a now bald patch on the left back of my head, making me wince. Things went by very fast from that point on. A doctor and my mother and father explained that I must have slipped and hit my head on the windowsill, being that that's where the first impact was made, before falling the rest of the way onto my tile floor. My mom had come into my room in the morning to wake me up for school, and found me lying in a pool of my own blood. She thought I was dead, because my breathing was so faint. But they had no idea as to why I had really slipped. I was too embarrassed and ashamed of myself to tell anyone. I didn't think I deserved justice for what Red did to me. Later on, I found out further obstacles would come from my injury, hearing loss in my right ear, as well as the inability to retain some old memories. This event and a few flash memories from my childhood are the last things that I remember from before the incident. Though I was saddened by this, I was happy to still be alive and never have to see Red again. Now being 18, a few months ago I signed up for Plenty of Fish again, I kept my wariness about me this time though, and didn't go on any dates. I looked out for warning signs this time and upon the first one blocked just about everyone that messaged me. Then one day I received a new message. It was from Red. I had blocked him on every other platform including his number. It just said, Hey, how have you been? I didn't respond but I looked at his profile. It still said he was 26. How odd. Perhaps I never really knew his real age. Perhaps I didn't know this man at all, being that he thought he had killed me and selfishly ran off without even attempting to see if I was alive or even if he could help me. Update. I've seen all the comments of people suggesting and demanding that I go to the police. I've already taken action on this a few months ago. I didn't include it in the original story because I didn't want to feel like a fool. I went to the police by myself after seeing him on Plenty of Fish again, and they had no records for anyone with his name or age. I gave a description, but it was just like the description of any generic Hispanic male, and they couldn't really take action on it. I had no pictures with him, and his Plenty of Fish pictures all had his face covered somehow. The first time I ever really saw his face was when we started Snapchatting. He used to have an Instagram, but I guess now it's been deleted. I even tried to tell them the names of his two toddlers, but they couldn't find anything with that either. This incident happened in the summer of 2015. I lived by myself in a nice house in a small town. Very low crime rate, but there's still the occasional shady fucker. Anyway, at work that day on a smoke break, 
I watched a dog get thrown from a moving vehicle. Four-lane city traffic during the start of rush hour. I ran right out there and scooped his little ass up and booked it back to my workplace. Luckily, he did not get injured at all. It was quite amazing, actually. As a bleeding heart animal lover, I decided to take him home with me. At least until I could figure out what to do with him. I have a large amount of cats and always have. This was my first experience with a dog that I was solely responsible for. This guy was very shy. Head hung, tail tucked, very jumpy. Just looking at me like I was about to beat him senseless. I was clueless at the time on the subject of dog personalities and tendencies. I just knew they needed to be taken out frequently. His first night with me, we had been out about 15 times, as I really didn't want him shitting in my house. I was having my final cigarette of the day on my porch, at around 22.30 hours. The dog was on a lead chilling under my chair, as I smoked and poked about on Reddit. I see a man walking on the sidewalk that runs by my house. He kept glancing up at me before passing. Shortly after he passed my house, he stopped, turned on his heel, and started fast approaching me. Uh, hi there, can you tell me where 302 Church Street is? He asked. I told him I would search the address on my phone, which of course was taking a minute to pull up. He explained he didn't have a phone of his own, and was attempting to get to a friend's house, taking small steps toward me the entire time. Finally, the address I summoned came up. It's exactly two blocks north of here, right on the southwest corner of the cross street, I told him, pointing in that direction. He locked his eyes on me, and continued to move slowly closer. Doggo started growling very softly at this point. I had honestly forgotten he was even there until now. Well, uh, do you mind if I take a look at the map? He grinned sheepishly. I'm kinda bad with directions, you see. I rose from my seat, pointing again. Dude, it's just two blocks up this road. All you need to do is follow it. Two blocks and the house will be on your left. I was making it very clear I was not just going to hand him my phone. Well, how about I call them then? I need to let them know I'm coming after all. He kept creeping closer, extending his hands. No, I curtly replied. Maybe I could uh, shoot them a text, perhaps. Pushing even closer. Dude, no. I started backward toward my door. Just, just let me see your phone. He was very visibly becoming pissed off, clearly trying to contain it, and getting way too close to my porch. As a last-ditch effort of getting this dude to leave me alone, I said, You need to get the fuck out of my yard. My dog is very protective, and I will let him fuck you up. Hell, I didn't know the first thing about this dog, let alone whether or not he had the capacity to fuck someone up. I just hoped saying so would intimidate this pushy phone guy. Like I had just said the magic words, though, my pupper sprang into action, a la the wolf creature of never-ending story. He emerged like a bullet from underneath the chair, growling, snarling, barking his little arse off. He jerked me damn near off the porch, trying to get at this guy. He sounded and acted like an 80-pound attack dog, not a 40-pound timid beagle mix. I was actually a bit afraid in that moment. I didn't actually know if this pup would suddenly turn on me instead. As stated previously, at the time I knew absolutely jack nothing about dogs. He backed his hindquarters into my legs, nudging me toward the door, still carrying on, eyes locked on the phone dude and baring his teeth snarling. The phone dude held up his hands and backed off. He stammered something like, Oh, uh, so two blocks north, yeah? And began walking away very fast. I went inside, cut off my lights, and peeked out the window at him. He kept glancing back at my house, assured I was inside. Then he turned and began sprinting in the complete opposite direction I had pointed him in. Icing on the cake, he immediately pulled a phone from his pocket and raised it to his ear to make a call. Doggo, of course, secured his place as a very valued member of my family that night. He's incredibly protective of me and has frightened away even another creep since this incident. He's very attached at my hip and has made it known he's grateful to be in a safe, loving home. 
where he will never again become a projectile from a moving vehicle. I've named him Hank now, and I truly believe that night would have ended very differently for me had he not been there to protect me. I'm not even entirely sure if this is the correct place for this, but I can't really think of anywhere else. I really want to talk about it, but I can't with anyone I know because of someone else's wishes. When I was about 11 years old, I had a steady babysitter named Jane. My brother and sister were 17 and 18, so they were either too cool to babysit me or busy with school around this time. Jane was around their age too, but I don't think her family had a lot of money, so she would babysit me almost every weekend, instead of doing normal teenager stuff. My family lived in a pretty well-to-do cul-de-sac in the back of a large neighborhood. It was one of those neighborhoods where houses got nicer the further back you went. The houses at the front by the main road were not as nice, but still not terrible or anything. This is where Jane lived. Since I was 11 and prepubescent, I was a huge pain in the ass. But not to Jane. I looked at her as a best friend. We did so many fun things together, and I could truly tell that Jane really loved me. One Saturday night, my mom was making plans for the next week. But for the very first time, Jane couldn't babysit, because she had her first prom to go to. She was very excited because the boy she had a crush on for years had asked her. I knew because she had been telling me about him since she started high school. My mother and I were both very excited for her, and I saw my mom hand her way more money than usual. Jane's eyes immediately teared up, and she gave us both a heartfelt hug and left. Now since this was the mid-90s, everyone got their babysitters from word of mouth. My mom had heard from another mother that a girl that used to babysit for her kids had just moved back to her parents' house after grad school. She lived right down the street from Jane. Her name was Becky. My mom called her up to see if she could babysit me that Saturday instead. Becky excitedly said yes, and then proceeded to ask my mom some very strange but not entirely alarming questions. How tall I was, what I looked like... There were probably some others in there, but I was just hearing my mom's side of the conversation. When she hung up the phone, my mom immediately said to my dad, Wow, she sure is thorough. I was just a little bit nervous, as Jane had been the only one to babysit me for years. In the rare instances she couldn't do it, my parents usually canceled their plans. This was a work party though, and my dad was being honored, so that wasn't an option this time. A couple of days before Becky was to come, I begged my mom to call Jane. I wanted to see if I could come over the night of prom and see her in her dress. My mom kept telling me she wouldn't want me there, and I could see pictures instead, but I insisted. So my mom called Jane and handed the phone to me. Oh, hi there, May. How are you? I'm good. I just wanted to see if I could come over on Saturday and see you in your prom dress before you go. Oh, sure. I'm getting my hair done, but you can come after that, maybe around 5.30 or so. I tell your mom to call first and make sure I'm home, though. Oh, it won't be my mom, it'll be Becky. Dead silence. Wait, what did you just say? Since you couldn't watch me, my mom found a girl named Becky to do it. There was a long pause. Oh, okay, sweetie, that's fine. She hurriedly got me off the phone. I went to school the next day and came home to my mom hanging up the phone and shaking her head vigorously. Poor Jane. Her date doesn't want to take her anymore. Seems they had a fight. She wanted to know if she could still watch it this Saturday. I feel bad canceling on Becky, but I guess it's completely up to you. Of course, I chose Jane. And as usual, we had a lot of fun together. I didn't bring up the prom because I really didn't want to make her sad. Then, though, she asked me if I wanted to play dress-up with her. We did each other's hair and put on my mom's dresses and took pictures with my mother's Polaroid. It was the best night of my 11-year-old life. Jane went to community college after that, and by the time she went to a four-year school, I no longer needed a babysitter. We kept in touch a little bit after that, but before long we both got very busy, 
and we sort of lost touch with each other. That was where the story ended, until this past weekend. I ran into Jane at a bar. She was not sober. In fact, she was very drunk and didn't seem to be doing very well. She was extremely thin, and it looked like she had track marks on her arms, too. This made me really sad, because she was one of the people I loved the most in the entire world, at least at one time in my life. I sat next to her at the bar and asked her how she was doing. Her face lit up immediately, and she gave me the biggest hug. I always knew you would do well for yourself. Look at you, you're so grown up and beautiful. You look great too, Jane. No, I don't, but that's okay. We started talking, and she started drinking even more. I got the feeling she was nearing blackout territory. She was with a group of people that seemed to be her friends, so I wasn't entirely worried for her, but I still didn't want to leave her for some reason. She just seemed really happy to see me. So, we started reminiscing. And once it was my turn to bring up a story again, I said, Remember when that dirtbag stood you up for prom? We staged our own prom with pictures and everything. That was really great, wasn't it? She looked at me through foggy eyes and smiled a sad smile. He didn't stand me up, you know. That replacement babysitter was a sick fuck. When I was little, she would beat me, sexually abuse me, threaten me and lock me in closets. Then she would invite her boyfriend over to do the same things to me. She told me if I ever told anyone, she would kill my entire family and I would have to live in an orphanage. She took pictures of me too. I had it all repressed until you said her name that day, and then it all came back. All of it. I should have told someone, but I guess it's too late now. I just didn't want people to know what happened to me. I thought they would look at me differently. I regret it so much. Who knows what else she did because I never said anything. She set down her drink and gave me a big hug and said, Good to see you. Like she hadn't just dropped this major bomb on me. Then she stumbled away with her boyfriend. Everything came flooding back to me in that moment. The phone conversation with Becky with all the details. Jane's silence when I said her name. How Jane stayed with me every single weekend from then on until I was old enough to never need a babysitter again. Some people might say she should have told someone. But she was just a kid. She was an extraordinary kid. She gave up her prom to save me. She gave up every single weekend after that so nothing bad would ever happen to me. She was my guardian angel. Unfortunately, Jane didn't have her own Jane. And that makes me feel terrible. This story happened to me around six months ago. I lived where I lived for three years. It's a nice apartment in an amazing location, but they were built in the 90s. The last few years the city I live in has had a massive population boom, and people have been non-stop pouring in. It has good weather, an amazing economy, and it's a cool place to do stuff always. Because of this, I've seen the landlord staff start to do heavy maintenance on the apartments to bring them up to date and attract more people to them. My neighbor lived in his apartment for something like six years before he finally ended up buying a house and moved away. When he moved, the landlord immediately started redoing his apartment as one to bring up to date. The way that the apartment layout is, is there are two stories. Where my bedroom is... On the direct other side of the bedroom wall is the staircase to my neighbor's apartment. The way my bedroom layout is, has my bed right up next against that wall. They were completely stripping this place clean. It was actually one of the first ones that they did such heavy remodeling for. For weeks, I would always see workers over there painting, redoing floors, etc. A few days before this happened was no different. I left and saw them doing maintenance on the kitchen and when I came home from work, they were already gone for the day. Nothing unusual, not even a single bit. The part that is unusual, though, is what happened one particular night. I was awake around 1am watching TV in my room, when I heard someone on the other side of the wall slowly walking up the stairs, and very obviously stopping halfway up. Where the person was stopping was directly where my head laid on the other side of the wall, 
I could just feel him listening to me breathing. I immediately turned the TV sound off and sat there extremely quiet and still. I heard nothing for a few minutes. Then after what felt like an absolute eternity, I heard the person begin walking the rest of the flight of stairs up to the second floor. My survival instinct kicked in instantly. It was very obvious that the person on the other side of that wall had been listening to me. I also knew it had only been two days before this happened that I'd seen the maintenance redoing that apartment's kitchen. I knew there was no way someone could have already moved in that fast. I quietly got out of bed and went to a room where I had a better view of the outside of the apartment. I obviously couldn't see if there was movement in there from the window, but I had a good angle to see if anyone walked out. I sat there for around 15 minutes, just staring outside to see if I saw anything at all. Nothing. I went back to my room and laid down in my bed again. This time, though, I didn't play the TV. I just sat there waiting to hear something once more. I was messing around on my phone for about 20 minutes in silence until I heard movement on the stairs again. This time, though, the movement didn't start from the top or the bottom. The movement started in the middle of the staircase, meaning that the entire time I had been sitting there in silence, this person was just on the other side of the wall, listening to my every move. This terrified me, so I called the cops. I gave them all the information of what was going on, and they informed me someone would be out very soon. I went back to the one room and watched the window again. Only a few minutes later, a police car pulled up. A cop got out to examine the building and the apartment. He was looking around and shining his light in the windows. I heard him knock on the door and shortly after, I could hear him begin talking to someone but couldn't make out what they were saying. I was totally puzzled by this. The officer walked over to my door and knocked. I walked downstairs and he informed me very nicely that someone had just moved in there. I laughed and was completely embarrassed. I even said to the cop, what a hell of a way to meet your new neighbor. I felt very embarrassed, but more importantly, I felt very relieved about the entire situation. I brushed off the whole thing as it just being light and my mind playing massive tricks on me. The next day though, when I went to leave my apartment, I saw something that made me stop dead in my tracks. I went outside and only took a few steps toward my car when I saw maintenance over there carrying out the old refrigerator. I was puzzled. I walked over to the apartment, and I looked in the door that was wide open. The kitchen was still being worked on, and not a single piece of furniture could be seen. I was legitimately speechless. I walked right over to a maintenance man and asked, Hey, didn't someone just move in here? He informed me no. The apartment wouldn't be ready for showings until at least three weeks later. I ran back upstairs into my apartment and called my landlord. I asked her if someone was staying there. She said absolutely not. I told her what I'd experienced the night before. She was completely floored and told me she would change the apartment's locks right away. She also suggested I call the non-emergency line to the police department and inform them that no one actually lived there. I did just that and they asked me to come down to the station. I told them all of the information in detail of what happened. They were able to quickly figure out which officer came out to check the situation so he could help identify the person who answered the door. The officer described the man in detail and I confirmed I had never seen him around the apartments before. There was a search around town for a few weeks until the whole thing just sort of fizzled out and I stopped hearing about it. I started seeing less and less patrol cars randomly in the parking lot too. After that night, I never heard another thing in that apartment. Around a month later, an older couple moved in, and they're honestly very nice. When I saw the moving van pull up, I went outside to introduce myself to them. But to be completely honest, the only reason I went out there was to see if any of them matched the description of who the cops saw. Not even close. I'm certain that the person who was in that apartment got away with it. I had an extremely hard time sleeping in the following weeks after that happened to me. I actually ended up moving my bed into the smaller second bedroom because it bothered me so much. I have zero idea what the intentions of the person were or what he was doing in that staircase, but it's easily one of the most chilling things that's ever happened to me.
I mentioned this story in a comment on another post, and thought I might as well add in the details and make it my first post to this subreddit. This takes place in a fairly large city roughly eight or so years ago. I'm a female, and at the time, I was around my mid-twenties. There used to be this gay bar that did goth nights every Saturday night. I would head out there fairly often with my friends. This night, there was a group of about five of us that went together. Plus, we always ran into more people we knew once we got there. At some point, I left my friends on the dance floor and went up to the bar to get another drink. It was pretty crowded, so the only place I could really squeeze into was right next to some guy on a bar stool at the very end of the counter. As I ordered my drink, he glanced over and said hello. He had a very interesting accent, so I asked him where he was from. He replied that he was originally from Ethiopia. We made some small talk as I was waiting for my drink, and I commented that I'd had a neighbor as a child that was from there as well. The exact details of the conversation are a bit hazy. It was years ago, after all, and to be fair, I was not exactly paying super close attention at the time. This means I'm not exactly sure how the conversation steered in this direction, but I do remember these words snapping my brain's focus immediately back onto him. I killed people there. Oh, well... I awkwardly chuckled, thinking maybe this was just some weird drunk guy thinking he would say weird creepy things to the goth girl at the bar. Maybe it was his really bad attempt at flirting. My drink arrived and I remember stirring it and trying to ease my way out of the conversation, but I was still waiting for my change. So you used to kill people? He shook his head and replied very casually. No, I still do. Uh-huh. My change could not arrive fast enough. I tried another awkward laugh and made some snarky comment about how I was fat, and if he tried to kill me, I'd fight back and sit on him or something. I don't know. I really had no idea how to respond to this type of situation. Again, very casually, without any emotion in his voice, he replied, There's no trying. If I decide to kill someone, I kill them. My change finally arrived and I took my drink which I had not let leave my hand or my sight for an instant. I excused myself and headed back over to my friends on the dance floor. I watched as he turned his stool so he could keep a firm eye on me. He just sat there, slowly sipping his own drink, never looking away from me. Finally, at some point, I saw him put down his empty glass and move out the front door. I sighed in relief and continued to enjoy my night. Several hours later, the goth night was finally ending, and the next theme DJ was taking over. My friends and I were saying our goodbyes, and I started walking to the front door. I turned around to see the friend that had given me a ride was stuck in a conversation with another acquaintance, so I waited near the door just inside the building. That's when he grabbed me. The guy from the bar dragged me in further, into a dark corner out of the line of sight of the exit. I was in shock. I couldn't even make a sound at first as he pinned me to the wall. Face pressed against it and he twisted one of my arms behind my back. It seemed like an eternity that he held me there, pushing himself up firmly behind me, almost like he was trying to hide me even further in the shadows. There were no lights near us and no reason for anybody to walk this deep by the corner. Even if I yelled, I wasn't sure if anyone would hear me since the DJ had just started up. Somehow, though, I managed to shove myself back against him once my fight instincts kicked in. In his surprise, his grip loosened just a bit, and the angle he held me at relaxed. I managed to slam my fist against his balls. I have no idea to this day how I actually bent myself around in just the right way, but he immediately doubled over, and I took off running. I grabbed my friend out of our conversation, and breathlessly gave a Cliff Notes version of what happened as I dragged her to the back emergency exit. Before I could escape, I was stopped by security. He told me I couldn't go that way and had to leave through the front of the bar. I tried to explain to him that there was a guy up there that had tried to attack me, but he just wouldn't listen. Maybe he tuned it out or thought I was just some drunk girl. 
Thankfully though, my friend and I managed to get the attention of a few other people we knew, and headed out the front as a big group. I didn't see the guy anywhere, but I was terrified of getting through the dark parking lot to the car. I just knew he could be out there, hiding somewhere. My friend and I ran as fast as we could, dove into the car and she pulled out of the parking space before I could even get my seatbelt on. The creeper dude was nowhere to be seen. I checked the news the next day to see if there had been any other attacks or, God forbid, any murders in the area, but there was nothing. I don't really remember many of his features, what he was wearing or even how he sounded like, but I will never forget the emotionless, blank, matter-of-fact way he stated that he killed people and the way his dark eyes stared at me like I was prey. I never went back to that bar after. I want to preface this story by stating that I've had my fair share of encounters with creepy men. This situation, however, scared the life out of me. It was the first time I genuinely felt like my life was in danger. My husband and I had to drive 17 hours last week to North Carolina for a wedding. It was honestly an exhausting week, and we basically spent the entire time rushing from one family gathering to another. We were staying in a motel for the time we were there. We had already been at this motel for a few days by the time the day of the actual wedding rolled around. And the day of the wedding? It was quite hectic. We were rushing around everywhere, trying to get ready to leave for the venue. My husband got ready before me, so he could do some last-minute things before we had to leave. That left me all alone in our motel room to get ready before he returned. It was extremely, brutally hot outside, so I decided to do my hair and makeup in just my underwear so I wouldn't be sweating in my nice dress the entire time. The way this motel was laid out, the sink and mirror were in the general open area of the room, with the toilet and shower in another room. So anyone walking by our room window could see me standing at the mirror. I did, however, have the curtains completely drawn closed. These curtains were a bit sheer, though, so you could technically see the shadow of someone walking by on the outside, or maybe they could see the silhouette of me inside the room. I was curling my hair in the mirror when I noticed the silhouette of a man walking by my room window. As he's passing by my window, I see him stop and start trying to look inside. At first, I thought it was my husband trying to see if I was ready, so I paid no mind to it. But the longer the guy stood there bobbing his head around trying to get a better look through the curtains, I began to realize it was not my husband. Obviously, why wouldn't he just come in if it was? Now I was starting to get a little bit freaked out. Before I could even do anything though, I watched as this guy started to go for my room door. My utter shock and horror came when he was actually able to open it and walked inside. Before my husband had left, he had forgotten to pull the door shut all the way until it clicked into the lock. He was very upset at himself when I told him this later. So now here I was, face to face with this man, in my underwear no less. He was at least six feet tall, just standing in my room staring at me. I thought to myself, this is it, he's going to attack you. That's a very scary realization to have. I also thought to myself, you're going to have to burn his eye sockets out with this curling iron if you want to survive. For a few seconds, probably only a second or two, but it felt much longer. He just stood there staring at me, like I was a piece of meat and he was starving, ready to pounce at me like prey. He then began to smile the most evil-looking toothy grin I've ever seen, and started mumbling something under his breath. I couldn't quite make out what he was saying completely, but I did make out the words pretty lady and come here. I don't know if it was the fight or flight response, but I just suddenly got extremely pissed. I charged towards him, ready to strike him with my hot curling iron. I screamed as loud as I could. Get the fuck out of here! It must have startled him quite a bit, because he jumped back and out onto the balcony of the motel. I saw this as my chance, and I ran for the door. 
Luckily, I was able to get to the door and slam it shut right before he was about to make his second attempt at entering inside. I immediately collapsed onto the floor sobbing. I was literally too scared to move from that spot until my husband came back 15 minutes later. I told him the whole thing and he was very freaked out. He initially wanted to find the guy so he could beat the shit out of him, but I refused to let him leave my side. He must have apologized a thousand times during the rest of our trip for not making sure the door was locked before leaving, but I told him that day was so rushed and that whole trip really that I could understand how it happened. We went to the motel management and told them the whole story. The police were obviously called and I gave them a description of the guy so they could see if it was someone who was staying in the motel. After going around to the few motel occupants, they said no one matched his description and concluded he was not staying there at the time. Obviously, we were late to the wedding that day and the whole experience just kind of ruined what should have been a happy time. We planned on staying another day before our long drive home, but we honestly just both wanted to get out of there as soon as possible. We skipped most of the reception, went back to the motel, and packed up and left. I'm usually always so vigilant when locking my doors, especially when I'm home alone. Just goes to show you that all it takes is that one time you forget to check your locks for a certain unwanted guest to invite themselves inside. I'm really writing this out as a way to vent because I'm in a situation where I kind of feel really stuck. Any advice is appreciated, but I'm not sure there's anything that can be said that will actually help. I've tried just about everything, so I'm going to start from the beginning. This is a story two years in the making, so I'll try to be as thorough as possible. In 2019, I graduated with my master's degree and moved to a relatively rural area for my PhD. Thinking we'd make an investment, my dad and I purchased a house. The intent was to rent it out once I completed my PhD. This house was only a block away from a dive bar where my dad was able to make some pretty good friends. He introduced me to everyone, and everyone let me know that I would be so happy in my new house because my next door neighbor was the absolute nicest guy you could ever meet. So we met the neighbor, and he did seem nice enough. He suggested we exchange numbers, just in case I ever needed anything, and I thought that was a pretty good idea. I mean, what's the worst that could happen? A few days later, my dad left to go back to his home in another state, and I was left to my own devices. Literally the exact day he left it started. My neighbor texted me while I was away and let me know he left a gift for me on my front porch. In this text exchange, he started using pet names like Sweetie and Cutie. I went home and he had left a hand-painted feeding dish for my cats in my mailbox. At this point though, I wasn't that alarmed. He was just being extra nice, I thought. The next day, he sent me more texts with pet names and I took the opportunity to make sure he knew I was not interested in anything romantic. He replied back with some rambling text about how all a person ever needs is friends and he would just like to be friends with me. After that, he would send me texts very frequently. Everything from inviting me fishing to telling me he left more gifts on my porch. I would often not reply or just tell him I was busy. I didn't mean to be rude but I also had no interest in any sort of relationship with him other than neighborly. One night, I got a text from the manager of the bar down the street, letting me know that if my neighbor ever knocked on my door, I should not answer. She then told me that my neighbor had walked down to the bar with a hatchet and told the bartender he was hearing voices that got louder as he got closer to the bar. He'd threatened to kill someone with the hatchet if the voices didn't stop. They called the police and the police took the hatchet from him, but they made no arrest. The manager of the bar picked me up and I spent the night at her house. She told me that the police said my neighbor was on meth. After that, I tried to keep my distance even more, but things got even weirder. One day, I went out to my car to find a dead squirrel in my driveway. This squirrel had very clearly been run over and moved right in front of my driver's side door. I stepped over it 
got in my car and left. When I returned home, the squirrel was gone. Shortly thereafter, I received a text from my neighbor that said, Someone or something put a dead squirrel in your driveway, you know. Don't worry, I moved it away for you. I felt this was a weird way to word this, and I suspect he's the one that placed it there in the first place. Another time, I walked out of my house to see he had placed an unspent shotgun shell on the bricks in front of his yard. He came out and told me it was to serve as a warning for anyone walking between our houses. For the next couple of months, I did my very best to avoid him. He would text me inviting me over and I would come up with an excuse or just ignore him completely. I still wanted to remain cordial since he was my neighbor, but it was getting very annoying and I was starting to get uncomfortable. He would text me as soon as I got home, telling me he was watching me come and go from my house. Around Halloween, he handcrafted a large basket and wrote, Here lies the last son of a bitch who played mind games. November 2012. What the fuck? All this time still sending me these texts. Eventually, I got fed up and stopped responding completely. Less than two weeks after I did so, he threw a 50-pound flower pot at my front door. You know those big concrete planters? Yeah, one of those. I called the police who advised me to get a stalking no-contact order. A few days later, I was watching TV when a notification popped up that my neighbor was trying to cast a video to my screen. I declined it twice and filed another report with the police. During this time, I did start the process of getting a stalking no-contact order. I saw three different victim advocates, who all told me different things. I went out of town for a conference, and during that time, someone attempted to break into my home. I had an ADT security system, so while they had not succeeded, I was made aware of the attempt. After the conference, I came home to the entire world shutting down because of COVID. I was trapped in my home 24-7, with my stalker neighbor next door. Luckily, court proceedings for protection orders didn't stop, though. Right before court, he sent me a text telling me he was sorry for what he'd done. That he could tell when he'd seen me outside that he made me uncomfortable. Then he went on to tell me he could tell my hair has gotten longer, and I looked more beautiful than ever. I went to court and provided all of the evidence I had. The timeline of everything that had ever happened. The text he'd sent me asking if I wanted a massage. The text I sent him telling him the way he was speaking to me was inappropriate. The text saying he knew that he made me uncomfortable. I also told the judge I suspected he was the one who attempted to break into my house while I was out of town. The kicker is, he didn't deny any of it. Actually, he told the judge he took full accountability for everything. He said he was in recovery and was trying to turn over a new leaf. He didn't oppose the protection order at all. So in March 2020, I actually received the stalking no-contact order. Everything was pretty quiet for a while. I mean, he did some weird shit every now and then, but that's just because he was a weird guy. It wasn't anything that made me fear for my safety, though. That is, until he got on drugs again. At this time, we found an unspent shotgun casing in my flower bed. It was consistent with the one he had previously used to send a warning. This occurred a couple months after I started dating my boyfriend, and I suspect it was a warning to him. After this, and for a variety of reasons, my boyfriend moved in with me. He moved in pretty quickly, but everything turned out fine. We're still together and as happy in our relationship as we can be. New Year's 2021. I was awoken suddenly by yelling. I turned on my security cameras and got footage of him sticking his head out his window screaming obscenities at my bedroom window for seven minutes. It doesn't sound like a long time, but when your stalker is screaming threats and obscenities, seven minutes is quite a while. He even called me a harlot. He said happy fucking new year, and he said he was going to blow up his house with his gas line. I called the police who responded very quickly. They told me he never said my name, so they couldn't prove it was a violation of the protection order. The officer said, and I quote, There's nothing illegal about yelling in your own house. They left without even speaking to him. All I could do at this point was do my best to avoid him. I parked on the street because my driveway was pretty close to his front porch. I got used to living with my curtains drawn. I always made sure my cameras were charged, all five of them. 
Yes, because of him, I spent over $1,000 on cameras. Every inch of my yard was covered. Since then, he's been seen by me and other neighbors, talking to people who aren't there, going outside and screaming nonsense. Things like, I have Cheerios on my necklace, or I'll shove my penis in your butt. I'm not even joking. This basically brings me to last week. In the morning, I was getting ready for the day, when I heard a bunch of screaming. Someone is gonna die over this sweatshirt. I turned on the cameras. I got footage of him walking around the alley behind my house, screaming. Are you fucking proud? How about I get my shotgun, and I'll get everybody all fired up? I called the police. Once again, they didn't charge him with violation of the protection order. Instead, they gave him an ordinance violation for disturbing the peace. The police just told me it seemed like he was off his medication again, and that was that. They left. Last night, I was awoken to hammering outside my window at 1am. He was cutting down his privacy fence horizontally. I called the police for a noise complaint, and they just told him to stop. As I write this, he's outside continuing to horizontally cut down his privacy fence. That means the privacy fence only stands about 3 feet tall now. This was the one thing that made me feel relatively safe about hanging out in my backyard, and now that's gone. All of this is to say I'm fucking tired. I just want to live in a house where I can be sure that my neighbor won't try to murder me, where I can feel confident he's not going to try to break in. My boyfriend and I are trying to buy a house to move, but it's very difficult. I'm a PhD student, so I don't make very much money. Renting won't work because I have four cats plus my partner's cat and dog, although we have secured a place for those if necessary. And finding a place to rent with so many animals is difficult, if not impossible. I refuse to rehome them, so maybe it's partially my fault I'm stuck in this situation. My dad has agreed to co-sign on another mortgage, and I've gotten a second job. We should be able to save up enough money within a few months. But until then, I'm kind of stuck. I just don't know what else to do. I'm so tired and angry, so I figured I'd write this to vent. If you made it this far, thanks for reading at all. There's still so many different instances I've left out. But I'm just so exhausted that I can't tell them all. This happened three summers ago, but I remember the main events still. To preface this, I've been on a shocking amount of dates and put myself in many foolish situations in the past. I'm a female, and I was 25 at the time if that matters. It started on the Plenty of Fish app. I came across this really cute guy. He was my type physically, kind of nerdy looking. On his profile, he had very adventurous photos of him hiking and traveling. He seemed really exciting to get to know. Once he saw I looked at his profile, he sent me a message right away. We flirted a bit back and forth and exchanged numbers, even though he lived about an hour away. He said on the app he'd never been to my city, and didn't plan on it either, so we probably would never meet. I respected his honesty. I really don't like wasting my time. One day, shortly after meeting him online, he texted me quite randomly saying he was in town on some work thing and invited me to a bar he was at. I decided to meet up with him since I was already in the area. He said he would pick me up. I was dumb and agreed, even though it was just over four blocks away. It took him way longer than it should have to get me, and honestly, I don't think he ever really was actually at that bar. Once in his car, I noticed it was a rental as well and it seemed like he had just gotten his license because he was a very terrible driver. After driving in circles for quite a while, he told me to pick a place, but not in the area because parking was impossible. I picked a place about 15 minutes away by car, with plenty of parking around. It was also a very busy place though, since I was with a stranger. Once there, he started pressuring me to drink. He was very insistent. I'm not a huge drinker, but I do enjoy pub-style bars. I caved and had a drink, and was again pressured to have another. He was very pushy, 
and seemed really irate that I wasn't going for it. Usually I'd end a date pretty quickly if being mistreated, but he became charming enough to keep me there, at least until we were done with this date. I saw an old acquaintance happen to be at the bar and wanted my date to know I knew him. In my head, I think I wanted my date to know that someone could identify him. I'm not a paranoid person, but my subconscious was on alert. After an hour of talking in the bar, I told him I was about ready to get home now. He insisted we go across the road to get coffee though. This seemed quite strange to me. Neither of us had had much to drink, and we didn't really need to sober up. Coffee seemed like an odd choice anyway. I decided to entertain him a bit longer though. Once there, we sipped on our drinks. He told me he had rented a beautiful Airbnb in a nearby neighborhood that was more out of the city and into the country area. He told me he had it all to himself, and he invited me, going on and on about how beautiful it was. I kept politely saying no, and throwing around different excuses, which he would counter with a reason for me to come. With no intention of going, I agreed, but only if he would drive me home to get overnight things. I felt like he was not going to let me say no. He seemed satisfied enough with that answer, so we headed out to grab the stuff. While driving in the direction of my place, he said instead he would stop at a 7-Eleven and grab me travel-sized toiletries so I wouldn't need to get anything at all. I felt panicked because this was not according to plan. Something about him was starting to seem off, and I felt stupid for even getting back into his car to begin with. He turned this car, and then we started heading toward this more country area. Literally, there aren't any 7-Elevens or open stores this far in the middle of nowhere. I mentioned that I was actually thinking I'd prefer to not stay with him after all, and asked instead to be brought home. He then said something that made me completely nervous to be around him any further. He told me he was sharing the Airbnb with the owners, and said they were really fun and sweet. They always drink and play games together. But he had just said that he had the place all to himself. I knew I didn't want to make it obvious that I was catching on to his lie, so I went along with it and said, Oh, I have to wear my cute fluffy overnight PJs instead of my date dress. It'll be way more comfy and fun that way. I spewed off a bunch of other random things as well. I mentioned I also need my medication and absolutely could not miss a dose. Surprisingly, he actually turned around, and as we drove back into the city, I felt a bit more calm. I definitely did not feel safe yet, though. Finally, we got close to my place. I had no intention, though, of letting him get close enough to actually know where I lived. He was mentioning that he was going to come up to my apartment once we got there, and that was just a huge hell no. I didn't know what I would do, but I looked for an opportunity to get out of the situation, knowing he could just turn around and take me somewhere private in a matter of minutes if he wanted. Luckily, we arrived to a stop sign where people were crossing across the crosswalk. Thank God. I quickly but calmly got out of the car while it was stopped, and said I had a headache. I told him I'd text him later and close the car door. Then I walked through a public park which was beside a building that his car wouldn't be able to drive into. I looked back to make sure he wasn't getting out and following me, and I could see him staring at me. His eyes were so furious I have chills just thinking about it. Within the hour, he had already blocked me on plenty of fish. Looking back, I think he possibly wanted to get me that coffee to put something in it while I wasn't looking. I think he also told me on plenty of fish that we wouldn't ever meet to cover his ass when he did something. I know he did not have good intentions with me. Since then though, I have met my fiancé on plenty of fish and was super careful about dating up until then, making sure the first few dates were very public and arranging my own transportation from then on. Why I love cats, or at least one of the many reasons I love cats. I work about a mile from my house in a pretty small town, 100,000-ish, very spread out though. I grew up in one of the largest cities in the States, so living here has been kind of a bit of culture shock. 
It's very easily accessible by walking, so I pretty much never drive. About a half year ago, I had just finished work at around 1am. Nobody has ever really out past 8 or so here. Also a huge shock coming from that big city. So the park I walked through was utterly deserted. Mind you, I live in one of the safest countries in the world. Not America anymore. So it's easy to forget just how vulnerable you can still be as a small female. I honestly didn't feel uncomfortable at any point of my walk until I rounded the corner past some basketball courts nearby my house. I was still about two minutes away from home and this stretch of my walk was pitch dark. The moon was massive that night. While I had welcomed its light at the beginning of my journey and the absence of any streetlights, it actually made things look pretty eerie. I had walked this path before hundreds of times, but tonight for some reason, something felt off. I'm not a fearful person in any sense of the word, but I was suddenly really on edge. And then I saw it, a van in the parking lot next to the courts, with its side door wide open. I picked up my pace a little and kept an eye on that van. There are usually cars in that parking lot. I live in a tourist town and backpackers often stay in their vehicles to save money. But I had never seen one with its door hanging open like that in the middle of the night. Not ever. I was so focused on that van that I missed a man walking out from the trees near the courts until he was a mere 30 feet behind me. He was walking incredibly fast and there was very little doubt that he was heading straight towards me. I was at a complete loss for what my next action should be. Not like screaming would do much. I was still too far away from any residences. I usually carry a glass water bottle with me for protection. We have very strict laws on weapons here. But it turns out I had forgotten it at work that night. My phone was completely dead. Everything I knew better than to do I had done that night. And as stupid as I feel writing this, I hesitated to run away, on the off chance that maybe he didn't mean to act so sketchy. I've moved past this mindset overall since, but there's still a strong part of me that balks at the prospect of making someone feel uncomfortable or embarrassed. I also hate showing men that I feel scared of them, because even if they hurt me, I'd rather not give them any satisfaction of seeing my fear. Also, I kind of knew in my heart that I probably couldn't outrun this guy with the speed he was walking. I was overthinking every little thing. I saw a little dark blur darting across the library parking lot at the back of the courts. I didn't even register what it was at first. The whole situation was so surreal. The guy was behind me now, and judging by his footsteps, he had not veered course at all. I quickened my pace a little felt out my keys in my purse, and slipped them in between my fingers. I heard a slight jingling noise, and then everything suddenly made sense. That blur I'd seen was Apollo, a large black cat that often walked with me on the home stretch after the park. Tonight, he was doing that weird cat run, where they got real low to the ground with their ears hung back. I had an impression he was very angry, but he was moving too fast for me to see his face properly as he rushed right past me. I kept on walking at my fast speed, but suddenly I could hear the heavy footsteps were now retreating. I didn't dare to look back and kept moving forward as quickly as possible. Apollo suddenly appeared by my side, still staying low to the ground and stopping every few feet to look behind him and hiss. Then he would do his weird cat run to catch back up with me. He walked the entire way home with me as he had done many times but I had never seen him act like that. As we neared my gate, he visibly relaxed and flopped onto his back. I coaxed him inside before giving him some big hugs and head bumps. After that, I stopped walking home by myself at night and still saw my sweet little cat friend very often. I never saw him behave that way again, though. Apollo unfortunately moved away three months ago. I still miss my little buddy and often think about how strange that night was. I wish I'd turned around to see what he did to chase the guy off. I've heard many stories about dogs protecting people, but rarely ever any about cats. My own little girl would never do anything like what Apollo did. 
So, to the parking lot creeper, let's not meet. And to Apollo, I hope to meet you again one day. From 2006 to 2011, I worked in the electronics department at the local Walmart in the small city I lived in. Throughout those five years I had worked there, I had plenty of creepy encounters with strange customers, especially considering the state hospital was just across the road. This story isn't just a regular old creepy encounter though, but something that would lead to me being stalked for nearly an entire year. It all started in 2010, on a night I was working second shift. I was doing my end shift ritual when a woman in her late 40s interrupted me. She was there with a little girl, must have been no older than three or four. Excuse me, I need help with my cell phone? She spoke very softly and proceeded to tell me her problem. I need to turn my phone into a straight talk phone. The girl earlier said you could do it. Oh, fucking of course she did. I thought that to myself at least, but my lips instead said, Sure, let's see what I can do. She handed me a six-year-old phone from Verizon, and I knew as soon as I saw it that I would not be able to do what she wanted. I explained she would have to buy a new phone from Straight Talk and transfer her old number. Pretty basic shit, really. Now, I always took my job very seriously and held myself to the highest possible standard of customer service. I would often receive letters to the store from customers complimenting me, so I assure you I did nothing to actually piss off this lady, but sure as shit she was hella pissed. Why the hell would I want to buy a new phone? I already have one! She started screaming at the top of her lungs. Her claims being of me upselling her and being a corporate goon, I finally managed to defuse the situation, and as she left the department, she gave me the classic, you'll never get a job in this town again. As I'm getting ready to leave my shift, my manager stops me and tells me I just got a complaint at customer service from a lady claiming I swore at her granddaughter. Apparently, I told her to fuck off. I explained what really happened, of course, and my manager just laughed it off. He knew it was very unlike me to ever say anything like that to a customer. I wish the story ended there, but then of course I wouldn't be writing this. For the next several weeks I would get complaints about things I'd never done, sometimes even on my days off. I would come in to questions from my management nearly every day. It was all complaints ranging from me being rude to a customer, all the way to me doing drugs in the parking lot on break. All of these complaints were of course coming from two women. As it turned out, it was cell phone lady and her adult daughter. It turns out they had even been scoping out my work schedule and started coming in nearly every day. They would walk through electronics to make sure they saw me and I was there. And then later that very same night, I would have a new complaint. This happened for months. It happened so much, management deemed her my favorite customer. To be honest though, I didn't care much. Actually, I even thought it was pretty funny and a bit pathetic. I never got in trouble and everyone knew these ladies and just blew it off. I started caring though when she took it to a whole new level. She started to follow me around. I would see her when I was around town. She started to make it clear she knew where I lived and would regularly start to walk by my house. I would see her standing out front, just staring into my place. I began getting complaints to the city about my property. Grass too tall, old shed in my yard, my fire pit, basically everything. She even found out my girlfriend's name and began complaining at her job too. I knew it was her. She would make it so clear and obvious she was following me. Sometimes she would stop in and ask me questions at work and act like the nicest customer. Then she'd drop hints like, how's your girlfriend, or my favorite, how can you afford that big house on your little Walmart wage? For about seven months, she stalked and slandered me. I started telling her I knew what she was doing and to stop, but she played it off and I couldn't report her. After all, she'd never once threatened me. She was just making my life very hard. 
By this time, everyone in my life knew about this nut job. One night, I'm grabbing dinner with my friends from work and we're joking about it. When someone offers a suggestion, well, what if you just counter stalk her? At first, I thought it was a terrible idea, but they convinced me it would work and they would all help me. So we hatched a big plan like something you'd read on Pro Revenge. And it went as follows. Find her job, find her name, find her address, make complaints in the same manner as her. Find out all the rumors she's told about me, make it clear we know, and show her that unlike her, we have numbers. I found out her information easily enough. Turns out she didn't live anywhere near me. And it also turned out I was friends with a few of her co-workers. They would keep me informed on the crazy shit she said about me and even try to rein her in. And we began doing exactly what she was doing to me. We did this for about four months. The more we dug into her life, the more I found out about just how obsessed she was over getting me in trouble. She'd made reports I assaulted her. She encouraged others to falsely report me and follow me too. She told police I was a potential drug dealer. In the end, we won though. She started putting together that there were six of us digging deep into her life and asking many questions about her. My last month at work, I didn't get a single complaint. In fact, I never saw her anymore. The day after I quit though, I heard she started in the store complaining about a new person after asking one of the managers why I quit. I honestly will never understand why she was so hell-bent on trying to destroy me. I just told her to buy a $20 prepaid phone. I'm not sure if this was a trendy thing for anyone else in the early to mid-2000s, but when I was a child during this time, it appeared that many characters in books, films, and TV shows all had pen pals, distant figures with whom they were best friends and to whom they scribed whatever was going on in their lives. One of these TV shows, Grange Hill, actually featured an episode where a girl met up with her pen pal, who turned out not to be a French boy her age, but a creepy middle-aged man who shoved her in the back of his van. Apparently, though, I didn't let this sway me from seeking out a pen pal of my own. I searched up pen pals in Google and clicked on the first few sites. The one that I settled on already had a list of children's names, ages, locations, small bios, and even an email address. I scoured the page, but couldn't find anyone my age. The youngest girl was Lot, aged 12 from Amsterdam, so I clicked on her email address and tapped out a cheerful message, telling her that I was from the UK and that I was only 8. I was really mature for my age though, so please be my online friend. I remember she responded very quickly. She told me it didn't matter that I was 8. She liked younger girls better anyway. Retrospectively, that's a very creepy thing to say, but I was 8 and very naive. We very swiftly struck up a friendship and we would email back and forth all the time. I told her everything, about my annoying friends at school, my parents fighting, my love for Jacqueline Wilson books and Doctor Who. Like the idiot I was, I even told her the county I lived in and the town. I did not give her my address, but I was stupid enough to send her a picture of myself. She didn't send anything back though, and I didn't think to ask because once again I was an idiot. She told me I was really pretty. Things are still a bit fuzzy to remember, but one thing I do remember is that she kept saying she liked my eyes. A few weeks of this goes on. My older sister was the only person who knew, and she told me one day that she was not very comfortable with this. Because she was only older by a year though, I thought I knew better and brushed her off but she asked me to please at least tell our mom. I didn't want to, but I had this feeling in my gut that I probably should. That evening, I told her. Putting on my most persuasive voice, I tried to convince her that Lot was really cool and nice, but my mom is very protective, and she knew something was wrong. She asked me to see the emails, and told me that Lot was not a girl. She was a man preying on me. 
She pointed out the typing style and the email address. She didn't even talk like a little girl, she said. See, Lot's email address wasn't something simple like at hotmail.com, at gmail.com, or at yahoo.com. It was at something that, according to my mom, was a business name, not something a little girl would have an email with. Her writing style had also drastically changed over the weeks we'd been talking. It had gone from normal to typing like this. This didn't give my mom a very good feeling. She told me to stop emailing Lot, and I lied and said I would. Naturally, though, I carried on, but I was starting to get a bit unnerved. I emailed Lot a few days later, saying my mom wanted her mom's email address. She started questioning me why when she replied, but eventually she did give it up. I was relieved, though in hindsight I should have wondered why she didn't just want to give me it straight away. Maybe I realized this a little bit subconsciously though, because I asked her for a photo of her and another with her mom in return. Again, she questioned why, and asked if something was wrong. I just told her that my mom wanted to know what she looked like. There was no reply for a few days, but then finally I got an email from her. Attached were two pictures, one of her and one of her with her mom. They didn't look right though. They didn't look like normal photographs you'd just take with your family if you know what I mean. They looked too polished and professional. I think by this point the unsettling feeling was just getting too much for me to handle. I'm not good at shutting things down with someone even to this day, and I can't calmly and slowly end a relationship or friendship. So I replied to the email with the pictures and told her I never wanted to speak with her again. Malat didn't take that very well. Not well at all, actually. She told me she hated me and that I was hideous. She said a few other nasty things, but what freaked me out was when she told me she would make me as miserable as I just made her. You can guarantee that if I wasn't scared before, I was shitting myself then. I cried and told my mom, who was pissed about me lying, but worried as well. I guess when she banned me from using the internet for a few weeks, it was actually a protective measure, as well as a punishment. Nothing happened. This made me think that maybe I had freaked out on Lot for no reason. Maybe she really hadn't lied. It was only a year and a bit later though when I stumbled upon a new show and found out those pictures weren't Lot at all. Does anyone else remember an Australian show called Mortified? The photos she had sent me were actually headshots of the lead actress Marnie Kennedy. I'm pretty sure Lot had never existed at all. I had just moved out of a share house in the suburbs and into my own shitty one-bedroom apartment in the city. I'm a male and at the time I was around 25 years old. My apartment, while old and small, was located about 500 meters from one of the most popular night spots in the inner city. As I was in my mid-twenties and out on my own, this was pretty much the perfect place for me. This was because my friends and I were quite social and would frequent bars and nightclubs in the city and the taxi fares were starting to add up. Also, this new apartment was close to my work so it made a lot of sense. I got settled in right away and invited my friends over for pre-drinks before hitting the clubs. Due to the limited space in the apartment, this meant that some friends were inside and some were drinking on the walkway just out front. We had the music up and had just started drinking. But between songs, I could hear the couple next door arguing. Now, the apartment was old and shitty, which meant thin walls too, so I pressed an ear to the wall in order to listen in. I hadn't met any of my new neighbors at this time yet, as I didn't take too long to move in, and I didn't really see anyone during the process either, so I was curious. Judging from what I could determine while eavesdropping, they appeared to be a gay couple in their early 30s. One of the men was yelling at the other to go next door and tell us to keep it down. The other was arguing that it was just housewarming and to let it go for the night. Since I really didn't want to cause any trouble for them, I marshaled everyone outside to start making our way to the nightclubs instead and leave my new neighbors in peace. 
Later that night, I came home alone as I was very tired from everything. I decided to let my friends carry on partying without me. I arrived at my door and proceeded to fumble around for my keys when I looked up to see a man standing on the walkway in front of the next apartment, smoking a cigarette. He was tall and thin with brown oily hair. I also noticed he had a big cut lip and a faded but still visible black eye. Uh, good day. Sorry about the noise earlier, I said, correctly assuming he was my new neighbor. Nah, you're alright, mate. I'm Chris. He shook my hand. I noticed his knuckles were red and a bit scratched up, so I knew something was clearly off here. I apologized once again for the noise and said, Hope I didn't cause you any trouble earlier. He withdrew his hand with a soft but cracking voice and said, No, nah, that's okay. Rick just gets a bit cranky sometimes. I'm used to it. With that, I finished off the conversation and told Chris I'd see him later. It was about 2 a.m. at this point and I just wanted to sleep, but I couldn't help worrying about the potential domestic abuse going on next door. I decided though that all I could do was keep an eye on it for now as I didn't have all the info for the situation. For all I knew, he could have gotten into a fight with someone else later on. As the weeks passed by, I noticed that my new neighbors got drunk regularly and would argue severely almost every time. I could also tell that Rick was the dominant one as his voice was a lot deeper and Chris seemed to be very afraid of him during their shouting matches. This is why I kept my distance and never really socialized with them. I would often overhear them arguing about me specifically and that Rick thought that Chris liked me or something. I would try to tune all this out with headphones and video games, not to mention an active social life and full-time work to keep me occupied. I did, though, find myself avoiding having guests over because of the neighbors. I would instead opt to meet people out, as their arguments could become quite upsetting. This was working fine enough for a while, until Christmas Eve of that very same year. I was arriving home after having come from last-minute Christmas shopping. I was getting ready for a night of present wrapping, as I was to visit my family the following day for Christmas. As I arrived home... I noticed two police cars outside, and Anna, an Asian woman who lived a few apartments up from Chris, was screaming. I asked her what was happening. All she could say was, it's just so sad, while sobbing. I could see three officers trying to restrain somebody, and there was blood all over their uniforms. I came just a little bit closer, to see Chris's oily brown hair in the center of the affray. His face was bleeding from his jaw where he had apparently been slashed by something sharp. They got him to his feet, and I could see that the cut in his cheek was so deep that the skin was flapping open as he struggled and resisted with the police. I recoiled in shock and went to comfort Anna who was crying uncontrollably at this point. Suddenly, Rick's voice boomed out from nowhere. You see what you've done? You fucking loser! Just kill yourself! This frightened me and my instinct was to get myself and Anna to safety. Even though the cops were there, they had their hands full with Chris already, and I certainly didn't want to get involved in such an ugly fight where knives were already involved. Anna refused to come with me though and said she would be fine. I looked around to see where Rick was, as he kept shouting at Chris the whole time the three cops struggled to restrain him. I could hear Chris whimpering apologetically in between. I couldn't see where Rick was, so I decided to just go to my apartment and lock the door. As I turned to go, I froze in horror, as Rick's voice boomed behind me. And where the fuck do you think you're going? A deep chill went down my spine, as my brain struggled to reconcile the fact that these words were coming out of Chris's mouth. I felt panic grip me, as I realized that this entire time, Rick and Chris were the same person. All the fighting, laughing, drinking, and carry-on that I couldn't help overhearing the last couple months had all come from one solitary person, a lonely guy in his small one-bedroom apartment. For some reason, this made me sick. I learned later from Anna that this wasn't the first time the police had come out to take Chris away. She explained that he spends a couple of months at the local psychiatric hospital each time. His father owns the apartment so it's just there waiting for him when he gets out. I moved out a few months later, and while it is a sad situation for Chris, and I really do feel for him, 
I hope I never meet him again. The hotel I worked at was small, only 53 rooms in the entire place. It's located next to downtown in a town in central Minnesota. As a night auditor, you worked by yourself with the shift being from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. You don't get many people checking into the hotel that late at night. Maybe one to three at the most. The first duty as the night auditor was to lock the doors so only guests could get in with their key. There's also a phone on the wall next to the main entrance, just in case someone arrives after the doors are locked, or somebody orders a pizza or what have you. There's a front door in the lobby, a back door in the lobby, and two side doors. I proceeded to lock all of the doors and head into the back room behind the front desk to do some laundry. As there was no staff on hand to do it, another task for the night auditor was to finish any remaining laundry and house chores that weren't done during the day. There was a cordless phone you could bring with you when going into the back or around the other parts of the hotel. We had no more scheduled check-ins that night, but there were a couple of rooms available. At one point, I heard somebody try to open the front door. They were unsuccessful and left. Moments later, the phone rang, and when I answered it, the person on the other side did not talk right away. I walked up to the front desk when finally the other person began talking. They went on this spiel saying they were a former cop and something about forgive me because this part is a bit fuzzy and I semi blacked out due to fear, having court in the morning, and that if I didn't let them in, they were going to come in and shoot me, and they were now circling the entire hotel. There are windows that look out the front of the hotel that are visible from the computer I had walked to during the phone call. I told them I was very sorry. We didn't have any rooms available, but they hung up before I could even finish my sentence. I looked out the window and there was a person standing across the street, staring back at me with a phone in their hand. At this point, I was really freaking out. I go to all the doors and double-check they were all locked. It was a good thing I checked, too, because I found that one of the side doors had been propped open just slightly with a door stop. Obviously, I shut the door and proceeded to go to a conference room with sight of where the person was standing. I kept the lights off and peeked through the blinds, but the person was now gone. I was pretty freaked out for the rest of the night because there are windows pretty much everywhere in this hotel, so if this person was watching me, they would be able to do it all night if they so pleased. Luckily though, nothing else happened that night, but to the person who threatened to shoot me while I was working, I hope we never meet again. I was 14 years old when I had to live with my grandparents. I had to live with them because my sister was in college and my parents were divorced. They lived in this old bungalow type house. It was one story and we have stairs that immediately go up to the attic. An attic which no one really uses. We just store a lot of our old stuff in there. It's too hot and stuffy to be up there anyway. The sole window in there really didn't help much. The attic had these old creaky wooden floors that I remembered I had to polish with a coconut shell because that's how we do it here in the Philippines. That and my grandparents are very traditional people. Anyway, my door room was right near the stairs leading up to the attic. Like, you open my door, then face right, and the stairs would be immediately right there. I hated that every time I left my room because I would expect that something would immediately crawl down at me from the attic. One night, my grandparents had to pick up my aunt's family from the airport, but because of the hellish traffic here, they had to leave at 7 p.m., and their expected arrival at home would be at most 5 a.m., so a 14-year-old girl would be home alone the entire time. I told them, though, that it was fine. I would be perfectly safe here. After all, we live in a gated community. We have tons of guard dogs. Surely everything will be okay. At least, that's what I thought. 
Before they left, we already had dinner, so I was stuck with cleaning the dishes and all that. As I was doing so, I could hear a bunch of neighboring dogs start barking quite a bit. I didn't really think too much of it. I mean, dogs always do that. When I finished cleaning up from dinner, I immediately had to lock every door and window and close off all the lights before heading to bed. When I entered my room, the lights were open and it looked normal. My anime posters were hung all over the wall, my closet was untouched, my bed was next to my barred, tinted windows. We had to tint them because I was on the first floor, and my grandparents wanted to make sure no creeps could peep into a young girl's room. They were barred as well because my uncle who used to use the room always escaped through there to go to parties. This was my grandparents' solution to that problem. Nothing was out of place to alarm me. Everything was normal. Until I closed off the lights. As soon as I did so, the silhouette of a man was illuminated by the streetlights outside. He looked like he had thick curly hair and a very skinny build. At first, I thought I was having hallucinations. So I turned on the lights again. He was gone. I closed them again. There he was once more. Opened. Gone. Closed. This time, he was gone then, too. I sighed in relief. I guess I was just tricking myself. Or maybe something else had been casting a shadow. I double-locked my door just to be safe. One with the door knob lock and one of those door latch type locks. Then I tucked myself in. It was hard to fall asleep though when so many dogs were barking outside. They weren't our dogs, they were our neighbors. Finally though, I was just starting to fall asleep when I heard something from above me moving. Something in the attic. I pushed down the thought. Surely I'm tricking myself again. I hugged my pillow tight. It must be just rats, I told myself. Those rats seemed awfully heavy though, and it sounded like they were pushing furniture around as well. My heart sank when I heard them hurriedly rush down the stairs and stop at the bottom. I covered myself with my blanket and waited for something. I was also wishing that my parents had given me a phone at a time like this, but all I could do was wait with bated breath. Suddenly, I heard my doorknob being gently fiddled with. I wanted to vomit when I heard a click, followed by a quiet turn of the knob. The knob turned, but it didn't budge. When they noticed this, they tried to push it. This time, I had finally stood up, shaking. I was just a kid, home alone with no phone and no means of defense. All that was between me and this intruder was this thick door from very old days. I softly pushed my body up against the door and made sure everything was locked tight. I didn't want to make a single sound. I didn't want to scream. I didn't want him to know I was there. I don't know why he stopped, but he just did. I didn't go back to my bed, though. I sat there by that door, waiting. It felt like forever before I finally heard the footsteps returning up the stairs, but still I sat there. After a while, I saw something move out of the corner of my eye. There, out the window, the shadow was back. I forced myself not to look. All I could think was thank God those windows were barred. I can't even remember what happened after that. I think I fell asleep or something, or maybe I was too scared to even think. I just remember the next day when my family and I were having breakfast. I casually brought it up. Grandpa, I think I heard footsteps up in the attic last night. My grandmother scoffed at me. It was probably just rats. I never brought it up again. I didn't want them to worry. But I do know this. Our dogs were caged up near the gate and were far from my room, so they wouldn't have seen anything. The only dogs that were near my room were the neighbors. Also, there was nothing outside my window that could cast a shadow that looked exactly like a man. And when I checked later, I noticed that the attic window was open. This happened about a year ago. There were so many terrible factors working against me that night. I'm astounded that I got away unscathed, 
at least physically. This all begins when I'm at my friend's apartment, who lived in a really rough part of town. In a series of somewhat poor decisions, that night I decided to get belligerently drunk and take a few pills of God knows what. I know, I know. Safe to say, after a solid night of partying around 4 a.m., I was not exactly in the right state of mind. My drug-addled brain decided that instead of staying the night at my friend's apartment like I normally would, I wanted to Uber back to my own place. My friend's apartment had two separate entrances and exits to the building. One in the back, unlit parking lot of the building, and one facing the street. They had two sets of keys for each door, and I only had keys to the one in the back of the apartment, since my Uber would obviously arrive on the street, and the door in the front of the building locks itself behind you, I exited this way when the driver was soon to arrive. Looking back, standing outside that apartment, I realized I must have looked like the easiest target on the entire planet. I'm a small, petite female in my early 20s, and I can hardly stay upright at that moment. I was using a street lamp to prop myself up, and not doing all that good a job at it either. It was basically a beacon for any nearby predators saying, Come get me! I'm not paying attention to my surroundings at all in this state, despite the fact there was literally a bullet hole in the front door I just came through. Not very good. I remember vaguely checking to see what car I was getting picked up in, and was only able to pick out the fact that it was a black sedan. Soon after stepping outside, a black sedan pulled up to the curb and started rolling down the window. I stepped forward, but before this man even spoke, I could still feel something was wrong. He had this expression like he was tearing me apart with his eyes. After seeing that look, it gave me a whole new meaning to the word predator being used to describe a criminal, because I knew in that moment what it felt like to be the prey. He basically barked at me. I'm your Uber driver. This was the second red flag that somehow made its way through my brain. Normally, an Uber driver would just roll down the window and say, Is this your name? Or any version of that. Always including your actual name. I think I just stared at him for a moment, my brain slowly piecing together the situation I was potentially in. So I asked him, uh, What does it say my name is? He immediately got enraged and started screaming about how he doesn't have time for this and to just get in the fucking car. I don't think I'd ever sobered up so fast in my life. Now I was completely panicking. Obviously, this guy was not my Uber. Quickly checking the license plate, I immediately saw it was not a match. Meanwhile, this guy was still screaming at me and I had absolutely no idea what to do. If I bolt in either direction, the guy could easily outrun me or have a weapon on him. I'm also pretty sure at this point that if he's trying to nab some random girl off the street, he must be packing some weapon of some sort. I can't exactly run back into the apartment door right behind me since it locks behind you and I didn't have the keys nor the time to unlock it. Running toward the back door would do nothing as well, as he was idling right by the mouth of the driveway toward the back parking lot and again, I would have to take the time to find the right keys and get in. If I screamed, well, it's not exactly the type of neighborhood where someone would try to be a vigilante. I could hear the music radiating from my friend's third floor apartment still. I knew they wouldn't be able to hear me. It was also 4 a.m., and absolutely no one was around. People talk a lot about how they either sprint into action or freeze up, but I felt incapable of doing either. It was the absolute worst feeling I've ever felt in my life. Everything in me wanted to run, but I felt like if I did, it would be the immediate end of me. If I kept standing there though, staring in shock at this screaming man, well, obviously the result would be the same. From when he started screaming at me to this point, I'm guessing only 20 seconds passed by. Just as he was looking ready to get out of the car and confront me, Another black sedan pulled up right behind him. Checking the license plate as quickly as I could, I realized this was my actual Uber driver and made a full sprint to the car. I threw myself in, screaming at my Uber driver, What's my name? 
The poor dude looked terrified, but responded very quickly, to which I replied, Get me the fuck out of here! That man is trying to kidnap me! If I was in this Uber driver's position, I think I would be too shocked to even react. But luckily, my dude flew out of there and offered to call the cops for me as well, which I declined and now regret. He then walked me to the front door of my apartment, ensuring I got inside safely. Truly, what an incredible human being. You can rest easy knowing he got the fattest tip my college bank account would allow for, although he deserved much, much more. This happened a few years ago when I was bartending in college. I was coming home down a stretch of divided highway at around 3 a.m. when I noticed a car heading towards me in the wrong lane. I doubted myself at first and thought the car must be on the other side of the highway. Sure enough though, a white Ford sedan passed me at an extremely high speed, at least 90 miles per hour. It's worth noting for later that I also drive a white Ford sedan. I was used to drunken idiot drivers in the middle of the night, so I pulled over to the side of the road and let him pass me by. I had a moment of clarity and thought to call the police, thinking this person could either hurt themselves or somebody else. The dispatcher answered and after telling them which road and exit slash mile marker I was at, they told me they would send a car out. The state police station, it turned out, was only a few exits away, so I figured they would send somebody and I would just drive on home. As I headed back onto the highway, I noticed some lights a few miles behind me. I live in a more rural part of southeastern Pennsylvania, and traffic at 3am tends to be truckers and cops. The car gained on me as I was getting up to speed, so I stayed in the right lane and waited to be passed by. Instead, they flipped on their high beams, making it uncomfortable to drive, and rode right on my tailgate. At this point, I thought I was going to be pulled over by the police. I drove a white Ford sedan, and had just called about a different white Ford sedan, so I grabbed my registration from my glove box. Suddenly, the car behind me audibly slammed on the brakes and stopped right in the middle of the highway. They must have shut off their car, because the lights went out as well and I saw what looked like the same Ford sedan from earlier. Still, I thought this may have been a police car. They had a roof rack, and it could have looked like I had reached for my gun in my glove box or something. I panicked and called 911 for the second time, and asked the dispatcher if they had already sent a cruiser to investigate. The dispatcher was a little bit curt with me and assured me that they had sent somebody out. We have sent out a trooper to find the car, sir. Sorry, I, I only ask because somebody's following me and acting a bit weird. It could be a cop and I think I freaked them out by getting my registration. Are you pulled over, sir? No, they didn't turn on their lights. Let me try to get the trooper we sent out on the line. As she was talking, the car again sped toward me and stopped inches from my bumper. Again, their high beams were on and again they slammed on the brakes. I told the dispatcher... I'm pretty sure this is not the police behind me. The car sped up to my bumper again and turned their high beams on, this time slamming on the horn. Hearing this, the dispatcher asked me what was happening. What's going on? Did you honk? That's the car behind me. I don't think it's a cop. I'll try to get the trooper again, but I don't think that's him behind you. For some reason, this is what shook me. Before that, I was thinking I would get pulled over and maybe get a ticket. Up until then, I was going the speed limit and trying to avoid getting pulled over. I told the dispatcher, I don't care if I get pulled over, I'm speeding away and if they put their lights on, then I'll pull over. I started to accelerate, but the person behind me just kept pace with me. The speed limit was 55 and they kept on my bumper the entire time. Then they started swerving back and forth. I tried to signal for an exit then bail on it, but they followed me very precisely. At the next exit after that, I took the off-ramp and continued onto the on-ramp, and the car followed behind me the whole time. I thought about trying to get to Wawa, a convenience store slash gas station that's pretty much the only populated place in southeastern Pennsylvania at a 3 a.m., 
but the dispatcher and I thought that would be unsafe. She was very calm all this time and talking to another person trying to send the police to me. The other person, maybe a supervisor, asked if I could drive to the state police station. Realizing that I was only one exit away, I told her I was coming there. She said that she would have troopers meet me outside. As I pulled off the exit to the station, the car followed me. I blew a few red lights trying to reach it, and the car tried to pull into the other lane to pass me or pull up alongside me. Once the police station was in view, I put on my turn signal, and the car slammed on its brakes again, turned off their lights, and turned into a parking lot. The story ends kind of anticlimactically, as I pulled into the police station and met up with the troopers. Two of them went to find the car, and I stayed with a third. I thanked the dispatcher and her supervisor, and the state trooper escorted me home after taking a statement from me. I was never called to follow up or testify though, so I can only assume the person was never caught. Sharing this experience from literally last night because A, it's creepy as hell, at least for me, and B, I want people to learn from my experience. This is a precautionary tale. I understand that this was my fault, but maybe if I can help one person by telling my story, it's worth it. As a general rule, I don't drink very much, but once a month or so, I'll go out with my friends and binge a bit. My friends and I had a great night at a bar in the city, and they all left. I was chatting up a cute guy, so I decided to stay behind. I went back to his place. Post-coitus, very unsatisfying for anyone interested. I was ready to head home, so I called an Uber to pick me up. I didn't know where I was. I knew the city I was in, but not exactly my exact location. I order the Uber, but it's taking forever. You know, requesting, 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 so I cancel it and try again. Pretty soon, a car pulls up alongside me. I drunkenly mumble something like, Is this the Uber? I hop in. Mistake. Apparently, Ubers are supposed to have some kind of marking on the vehicle. This guy pulls away and starts driving. We're chatting, I'm fumbling for a cigarette, and the next thing I notice is that we're headed on the highway, but the opposite direction of where we needed to drive, and we're going a solid 90 miles per hour. Then I get a call from my Uber driver. He's there and I'm not, because I'm in the car with a fucking nutcase. I start texting my friend frantically, counting off mile markers for her. I realize it's going to do Jack, because she's probably really drunk too. I call 911, but I realize this guy was crazy. He was refusing to let me out of the vehicle, so I had to do it on the sly. It had been 40 minutes now. I was terrified. I don't know where I am. I don't know who this guy is. We're driving well over 100 miles per hour, weaving in and out of traffic. This guy is trying to get me to hang up my phone call. Yo, get off the phone. Who the fuck are you calling? You better not be a snitch. He was also smoking pot, so I didn't want to do anything that might provoke a violent reaction from him. I started chatting to the 911 dispatcher as if they were my friend, praying that they would catch on. Hey girl, it's me. Yeah, I'm with someone right now. We're driving past the highway exit. No, sweetie, it's not my Uber. I thought it was, but it's not. It's a shame you can't come and meet me and bring friends. Thanks, sweet baby Jesus, the operator caught on. He got me to stay on the phone while he sent out the cops, and we developed a sort of code. If I saw the cops, I was supposed to casually hang my hand out the window, which looked normal because I was smoking a cigarette. We pull into some random little housing complex, and he busts out some powder and forms two lines. I now have confirmation that he does drugs, which means he's probably emotionally volatile at the moment. I relay this to the operator, in code. Pretty soon, I could see the lights from the cop cars, so I start waving my hand out the window. At this point, I didn't care if he was onto me or not. I didn't know if he had a weapon, so I slumped down in my seat just in case things got hot. The cops surrounded us, got him out of the car, and then once it's safe, they extricated me as well. 
They whisked me to the hospital for a drug test and evaluation, and that's where my story ends. On my way to the hospital, as I'm explaining all this to the officer, I find out that the guy they caught 40-ish years on this earth, he's been in federal prison for almost 30 of them, all for violent offenses. I want people to learn from my mistakes. If nothing else, call 911 and stay on the line. So this happened over the span of around a year when I was 15 to 16. I'm 20 now, and it's only recently been revealed to me just how fucked up this situation really was. I was obviously still living at home at the time, but my sister, who's seven years older than me, had already moved out and was living with her now husband. Their high school best friend and some other dude they met via one of those find a roommate sites were there as well. He was kind of the reclusive, nerdy type, much preferring to hide in his room watching Star Trek and playing computer games than actually hang out with the roommates. The only person he ever really seemed to want to be around was his similarly shy and nerdy girlfriend. For a little context to the story, at the time this happened, he was 28 and she was 24. They were both a little bit weird, but initially they seemed entirely harmless. For the ease of telling the story and saving on characters, friendly roommate will be FR, weird roommate will be WR, and his weird girlfriend will be WGF. Now, my sister and I never really had the best relationship with our parents, and at this point things were especially rocky. Our mother was dating a guy at the time who, to put it kindly, was an abusive sack of shit, who seemingly loathed me for no reason and would find any excuse to go off at me. As a result, I spent a lot of time staying over at my sister's place. It was around this time when I'd started to spend a lot of time there, that WR and WGF started to get really strange. As I said earlier, the pair of them had always been kind of odd. They only ever really seemed to want to speak with each other, and would even go so far as to ignore anyone else who spoke to them. WGF was worse than WR for this by a country mile. He would at least give you some monosyllabic responses most of the time. She, on the other hand, just had this kind of creepy habit of blankly staring at you for seconds, then walking away if you asked her a question or tried to engage in conversation at all. That wasn't the especially weird behavior, though. When I would stay over, I'd sleep on a futon in FR's office space, which was on the ground floor. It happened to be next to the downstairs bathroom, which for some reason WGF vastly preferred to the upstairs one. She would take long showers in the middle of the night, which, whatever. I'm a pretty heavy sleeper and she wasn't a shower singer or anything like that, so I generally slept right through them. One night, however, I had stayed up mega late doing revision and homework and happened to be awake after she finished her shower. I was too absorbed in my task to really pay attention to anything else, but I definitely noted hearing the shower shut off because that was my indicator of how goddamn late it really was. Approximately 10 minutes later, I look up from my laptop, and there she is. I always kept the door open just a crack, because the room tended to get unbearably hot if I didn't. She was just standing there, outside my room butt-ass naked, watching me through the open crack in the door. I called her name and asked if she was okay, which seemingly startled her, because she walked away pretty sharply. I convinced myself that in my over-caffeinated, sleep-deprived state, I must have imagined the entire thing, and I didn't mention it to anyone. Fast forward around a month, I head over to my sister's one night to find FR kind of agitated about what he perceives to be a peeping Tom problem. He'd found fingerprints on the outside of his office window, in such a way that would imply someone had been pressing up against the glass and looking in. The blind in his room was slightly too small for the window, so you could see in from the outside if you looked through at the sides. The room was on the front of the house as well, and the window was easily accessible from the street. He'd become concerned that some random passing pervert 
had been spying on him while having private moments, so to speak, in his office, or maybe a potential burglar had been sizing up the joint. The police were called, but as they didn't have any external CCTV at this point, no evidence could really be provided, and ultimately not a whole lot could be done. To combat this escalating further, though, FR installed both internal and external CCTV on the house. This was all installed while WR and WGF were away on a holiday, and I guess everyone just kind of forgot to tell them about it. Another couple of months later, I go to my sister's to find WR's room empty, and I was informed that he had moved out. Of course, I asked why, and I was informed simply that he and WGF were a pair of fucking creeps, and the others had collectively decided to give them the boot. Apparently, her watching me through that office door was not a one-time incident. The CCTV footage showed that she regularly made a habit of standing and watching me through that cracked door, sometimes for as long as 20 to 30 minutes. I was usually asleep when she did it, so I never noticed. Not only that, but the fingerprints on the window had apparently been from WR standing outside and watching me after I'd showered and was hanging out in just a towel. This was a less regular occurrence, but apparently it was caught on camera enough times for it to be very concerning. As if that wasn't weird enough in and of itself, I was recently hanging out with my sister and her husband, and he passed this comment about how he wishes they'd told me the full story at the time, so I could have chosen to press charges. I asked what he meant by that. He revealed that not only had they both been secretly watching me, the CCTV also showed they'd mess with food and things that I bought, including clips of them licking all my apples, her spitting in my orange juice, even dumping regular cow's milk into my lactose-free stuff. That explained why I'd had a period of feeling really sick out of nowhere. To top it off, apparently when FR barged into their room to confront them about it, he not only found several shirts I thought I'd misplaced elsewhere, had been stolen by the two of them and literally hung on their wall like a shrine. She had done several drawings of me sleeping, and written a poem called Ode to My Name, whose contents I don't know, and never really want to find out. Apparently, FR gave them an ultimatum. You have two hours to get the fuck out of this house and never contact any of us ever again, or I'm calling the police. Obviously, they took the former option. They never tried to contact me subsequent to this, but I feel sick thinking of what they were potentially planning for me. I work at a large crafting store in California, and have been there for a year and eight months now. A little background before I explain what's been going on as needed. So last year, we hired this guy I'll name Hayden. Hayden was a little bit quiet on the first day, but quickly became more talkative over the next couple of weeks, and actually started to never stop talking. He would constantly say this really weird shit. For instance, one day he was put in charge of building furniture. Our store carries stuff like furniture and home decor as well. He was apparently having much difficulty assembling the table he was working on, and said something about slashing his wrists if he couldn't figure out how to put it together. Another time, we were both working in the stock room, and he kept talking about how much he looked like the Parkland shooter Nicholas Cruz. I have to admit, he did in fact look like him. It was kind of creepy. I remember one day I had just gotten off work and was waiting for my ride to pick me up when out of nowhere Hayden walked up behind me. He just stood there with an awkward smile on his face. I politely asked him, what's up? He said something to the effect of, oh, nothing much, just enjoying my lunch break. I'm thinking about going to that Taco Bell across the parking lot and shanking someone. He pretty much laughed and said he was joking after saying that. As my wife picked me up, we saw him walking toward the Taco Bell, and he flashed us this creepy-ass ear-to-ear smile. The last straw for me, though, was when he and I were assigned to work our first spring freight and get it loaded up on a large U-boat. Our shift started at 7 a.m. and was over at noon. It was 11, and we still hadn't finished our task 
because Hayden just would not stop goofing around. He also seemed to work very slowly on purpose and would only take one item to the U-boat at a time. Our boss came to where we were working and was upset that we weren't done yet. He told us we would both get ridden up if the job wasn't finished before we were off. I was quite pissed off at this point, and Hayden knew it. He seemed to feel bad for pretty much getting me in trouble and apologized profusely, but then he said something that really concerned me. He turned to me in the most serious tone I had ever heard him speak in since meeting him. If I get fired, I'll shoot this place up. He went on to tell me that he knew where all the emergency exits are and would first shoot all the cashiers, then move the other employees in the store. I'll admit that I didn't immediately report what he said, but it did have me quite on edge. I kept thinking about what if. After some convincing from my wife, I finally did the right thing and informed my manager. They took a written report from me and contacted the police. After two more days of working with Hayden, he was fired and subsequently arrested for his threats. The week after he got arrested, my boss held a meeting with the entire staff and told everyone what happened. After everyone left the meeting, he pulled me aside and revealed to me what the police and Hayden talked about during the interrogation. I don't completely remember what was said, but Hayden apparently admitted that he said what he said and kept asking if I had been the one who reported him. Fast forward to a few weeks ago. I was working at the same store and still am. I was heading to the break room for my final break when I heard a voice from one of the aisles to the left. A man was standing next to the paint case and asked if I could get him some paint. While I was opening the case, he addressed me by name, which I immediately thought was weird because I wasn't wearing my name tag on this particular day. Out of curiosity, I asked him how he knew. He said it was just a lucky guess, which I obviously thought was BS, mostly because his tone of voice was very sarcastic. The entire time I was getting his paint, he kept staring at me with this huge smirk on his face. He then began to ask me questions about my name, which is the same name of a popular TV show character. What year I was born, why my parents decided to give me that name, at this point I had started to walk away, as I had other things to do. The whole time I was walking away, he was still trying to talk to me. I could hear him yelling my name from three aisles down. I went and stood in the warehouse until I thought he was gone. Later that same day, one of my co-workers asked me if I knew the guy who was buying the paint, and I told her I did not. She told me he had approached her and asked her all kinds of questions about me, like if I'm a good worker if she likes me as a co-worker. This is an ongoing issue too, as he's come into the store two other times, one being yesterday during my day off, and apparently asked for me specifically. I don't know for sure, but I suspect this guy might be Hayden's cousin, as they sort of look alike and have very similar mannerisms. Both vaguely resemble the Parkland shooter and have that same creepy vibe as well. It might not be the scariest thing on here, but it is still freaky. Update. Tonight I worked the closing shift and was outside getting carts after the store closed at 8pm when two SUVs pulled into the parking lot. One of them parked behind the store and the other one parked in the main parking lot. I was standing in the front of the entrance doors when a man dressed in all black and wearing a hood stepped out of one of the SUVs. Another guy walked up next to him and they both started approaching the store. I politely told them we were closed. I looked down to notice a large bat in the hoodie guy's hand. I started repeatedly ringing the bell to be let back inside, and these two guys were just pacing back and forth in the lot, staring right at me. My manager let me in and called the police. The guys were of course long gone when they got there. This could have easily been a totally unrelated incident, but I thought I'd still update because the whole thing makes me think it could be you-know-who. This happened around 2006, when I was in my mid-twenties. My sister, the unfortunate main character in this story, had just turned 21. 
At the time, she and her boyfriend lived with my fiancé and I. On weekends, we went out to one of the two bars that had karaoke, air hockey, and the like. This particular night, we were at the bar further out from where we lived in the city, a good half an hour by car. Everyone was having drinks, socializing with people we knew. It was one of those places with lots of regulars. Singing karaoke? Nothing out of the ordinary, really. Except that night, my sister started hanging out with these two older ladies who had a liquor store in their purses and were quite willing to share. Although I did not know this at the time, she tended to drink a lot more than me, so that was a big score for her. Less money spent on drinks after all, but she ended up far more hammered than usual. Towards the end of the night, around 1.45, she was really extremely drunk. The aforementioned fiancé, my sister's boyfriend, and I were all in a heated air hockey game, planning to leave as soon as it was over. She walked up to us and said she was going to smoke a cigarette outside. Nothing unusual, everyone typically did this, until we were done. About five minutes later, we paid our tab and walked out, but she was not on the porch area where the smokers congregated. Okay, weird, but not totally alarming. We went out back of the bar to check for her. Inside, in the restroom, throughout the large parking lot. It's notable that this particular bar was in a business park, so there were multiple businesses that were closed, as well as the Mexican restaurant next door that had just closed as well. We searched and asked everyone that knew us, and even those who didn't if they had seen her, but somehow nobody had. I asked the workers from the restaurant that were sitting outside as well. They seemed nervous when telling me they hadn't seen her, but I didn't think on that much until later. By then, I was in a full-on panic attack after trying to call her cell about 15 times, only to have it immediately go to voicemail. Being a bit inebriated myself, I started searching for her, went as far as to take off my heels and start running down the highway, searching for her there. Honestly, there had been times she would start walking home in the past, though never from this place, as it was way far away from where we lived. The fiancé and her boyfriend thought we should go to the house to see if she'd gotten someone to bring her home. Seemed unlikely, but not unheard of. We get home, though, and she's nowhere to be found. Just as we were about to head back, and I was going to phone the police, I received a call from the PD on my phone. They indicated to me that they had my sister, and there had been an incident. I needed to get down there right away. We rushed to the PD where we were taken into a room with my sister. Her face was red from obvious crying, and bruises were starting to show on her arms and chest. She said that when she told us she was going outside, she thought we said we were leaving then, so she walked over to the car. After a few minutes being drunk and tired, she sat down up against it to wait. A van pulled up, and a young man started asking her directions to somewhere. She walked closer to try and explain, when suddenly the back door flew open, and two other men grabbed her and threw her in, taking off. They were very rough with her, hitting her a few times while holding her down, saying they only wanted money. They snatched her purse from her, breaking the straps, and searched it, quite haphazardly as they didn't find the $30 she had in it. After driving around a bit speaking in Spanish she couldn't understand, they pulled out a gun, making sure she saw it, and put a bandana around her eyes, telling her they were going to let her go. She was driven to some woods by a neighborhood she did not know. The door was opened, and they pushed her out, telling her to run, and that if she took off the blindfold or turned around, they'd shoot her. She ran and ran. Eventually, she did take the blindfold off and came to the first door she saw, beating on it and screaming for help. The police were called, she was picked up, and now we're back to my being there, hearing what I'd feared all along had happened. Report filed, police did a search and did locate the bandana she'd ripped off, but as she was so intoxicated and terrified, she was not able to give a clear description of the van, other than white older model or the three occupants other than young Hispanic men. The investigation turned up nothing as no cameras caught any of this event. 
Hell, we even had detectives in our home who said, Look, we need the truth. If you got drunk and just went home with someone and didn't want your boyfriend to find out, we will file charges on you. Aside from the bruises, broken purse, and her trauma, there was nothing concrete to go on. That was most unpleasant. I'm still fairly convinced someone at the restaurant knew something, given their suspicious behaviors when I asked about her, but the police were never able to find that link. All said and done, the guys were never found. Eventually, we just moved on in different states. It's now just a story in our lives. It still makes me sick thinking of what could have happened, but thankfully it did not. Be safe out there, kids. This takes place in October 1977. When my mom was 16, she ran away from her abusive home along with her friend, Lisa. They hitchhiked from Mass all the way to California. Obviously, this wasn't the brightest of plans, but given my mom's tumultuous home life and past experiences, she didn't see how it could be much more dangerous than anything she'd already experienced. They had a pretty safe and uneventful trip across the country, finding friends and many truck drivers and other travelers. It wasn't until they'd finally reached California when this encounter happened. The Hillside Strangler, at first thought to be just one assailant, ended up being two men who were caught and brought to justice for ten different murders. Anyway, to continue on with the story, my mom and Lisa ended up meeting these two guys who were super nice to them. They crashed at their place for a few days partying, but nothing bad had come of it at this point. These guys tell the girls that they're going to take them to the Hollywood Hills and Sunset Boulevard to see all the sights. Not being from the area, my mom had no idea that these areas were more crime-ridden at that time especially considering they were supposed to be sightseeing. My mom really wanted to see where all the movie stars got to live. These guys take my mom and her friend to some divey restaurant slash bar and get them both super drunk. It was also the first time my mom was introduced to and tried cocaine. After these underage girls were now completely high and drunk, they split off into pairs and my mom's friend disappeared with one of these guys. My mom was now hanging out one-on-one -on -one with one of her new guy friends. He then suggests that they stand on the sidewalk of Sunset Boulevard in the middle of the night, and if or when a car pulls up, she should get in and direct the driver to drive across the street to this dark parking lot. It wasn't really until the first and only car pulled up and she got in, that she realized this guy was prostituting her out. Keep in mind these guys have been nothing but kind and respectful to my young mom and friend for the past few days. Also, very sadly, this type of abuse was not a new concept for her either. She got into this car, and instead of pulling into the parking lot, he kept driving straight. My mom explained that he'd gone the wrong way. Now he started to drive faster, my mom moved toward the door, but he locked it, hit her, and attempted to hold her down all at the same time. He told her she wasn't going anywhere. My mom knew in her head she needed to get out of that car or she'd be dead, so in one swift move, she unlocked the door, tucked, and rolled out of the car. His car came to an immediate screeching halt. Thankfully, she saw some bushes in front of a house, so she ran to hide behind them. He turned around, searching for her, creeping slowly along. His passenger side was facing where she was hiding, and she was peeking through the bushes. She saw he had a gun. As soon as his car crept by, she ran to the backyard. It was all fenced in. There was no other way out, so she had to go back the way she came. By the time she'd crawled back into the bushes to see if he was still around, she saw his car had gone to the end of the road and turned back around. He passed by again. When she thought he was far enough away, she crawled out of the bushes to start running. But then she saw his brake lights. Confident he'd now seen her, she ran as fast as possible around a corner. She could hear his car gaining, so she had to duck and hide behind parked cars on the road. 
As soon as he passed by again, she booked it across the street, which took her through the parking lot she was originally supposed to be in and back to her friend. The creep did circle back again, but by then she was with her friend and they were leaving the area. My mom and her friend quickly ditched these two assholes and did find a safer place to stay. Only a short time later did my mom call home and eventually make it home safely. It wasn't until a long time later that she saw in the news a story about woman being murdered. She recognized the murderer, dubbed the Hillside Strangler, as the man who had picked her up that night. It was Kenneth Bianchi who drove his car that night. My mom said there's no questioning it was his distinguishing features and definitely his mustache. When I was in junior high school, I was quite an odd kid. I liked having colorful hair, piercings, and all that kind of stuff. And the school I went to was near Atlanta, so there weren't very many people like me. I tried to find friends that liked the same kind of music and other interests. And I could normally kind of brush off any weird energy that people put off and ignore it. I just wanted some friends. Anyway, I was in gym one day hanging out with a group of weirdos, and there was this guy that I hadn't ever seen before. He was wearing a Guns N' Roses t-shirt and jeans that were a size too small. His name was Ernest. We immediately clicked with each other, in a platonic way, because we laughed at a lot of the same things. We started hanging out in gym together every day, people watching and making fun of people playing basketball. It wasn't too long though until he started making fun of my appearance and making me feel absolutely terrible about myself. I had super bad acne in high school and he liked to joke about saying I had meth skin. First strike. Me being me though, I kept hanging out with him and eventually it led to hanging out after school as well. He would invite me over to his house and we would only stay in his room. He refused to let me meet his family. His parents didn't really speak English very well, I guess, but I still wanted to meet them. I always thought it was weird that Ernest didn't know any Spanish, but his siblings did, and when he could speak words, it sounded Russian. He pretty much only ever watched It Was Always Sunny in Philadelphia on TV and rambled about superheroes. He would always come up with these strange scenarios where he was an evil villain and how much power he could have. Fast forward and I get a job at a pizza place. Ernest gets the same job at this exact pizza place as well, so inevitably we're always together. Always. He pretty much never let me out of his grasp. It got to a point where he took me to school every day in his PT Cruiser, which still makes me get chills every time I see one of those damn shoe-shaped ass cars. We started skipping school a lot. I mean, we pretty much only went to school about two or three times a week. This is where things started to suck real bad. He started pressuring me to do sexual things with him. I don't really want to get into details because it's pretty disturbing, but he manipulated the situation in such a way that I felt like we were in a relationship because I thought I needed him. He really convinced me that we were a couple but I was so repulsed by him that I could never fully accept that. He started to tell our other friends that he'd had sex with me and that we were in a relationship. I denied it all. To this day, I still deny it. I've lied to therapists, I've lied to my friends, but right now I am admitting to all of that. At one point, he even ended up living with me and my family in the same room as me. He convinced my entire family that he was gay, just so he could live with me. He literally dressed up in pink and put a scarf around his neck and pranced around my aunt trying to win her over with this fake personality. I was so used to living in this chaos though that this was barely a problem for me. During all of this, he was such a rude piece of shit to me as well, of course. I remember asking him for a ride one day and he just said no. For no good reason, even though I really needed it, I started to get real pissed off because he would never actually give me a reason, just keep smirking at me. 
He did this type of thing very frequently. We were sitting in the living room once, and he silently got up and drove off somewhere, came back, walked to the living room doorway, stared at me for 15 seconds, and walked into my room. I could hear a bunch of rustling, so I stormed in there thinking he was up to something sketchy. He had completely dressed into his sleep pants with his hands in his pocket, and he just wouldn't take his hand out. At this point, I was a bit scared. I forced my hand inside and pulled out a knife. I don't remember how the night or days continued after that. Fast forward again and I'm at my best friend Kayla's birthday party and everyone is camping in the backyard. Ernest hated Kayla because she was a way out for me in his perspective. She got in the way of us. I'm sweating typing this out because this is probably one of the scariest things that ever happened to me. The sequence of events itself is a bit blurry, but I still remember it. I had made it very clear to Ernest at this point in time that we were not a thing, and he needed to let go of that fantasy. I had a crush on this boy named John, and we slept in the same tent together. Morning comes, and I can hear Ernest outside, asking people if they knew where I was. Someone said, she's in the tent with John. I was scared immediately. I knew something horrible was about to happen. The tent rips open. I don't have a shirt on. He begins screaming as loud as he can, cussing all of us out, just pitching an absolute fit and storms off. He goes to his car and calls me, and tells me to get in now. Everyone there was pretty freaked out. Kayla begged me not to go to the car because she knew how scary Ernest was as a person. I didn't want anyone else to be uncomfortable though, so I figured if I went it would ease everyone else just a little bit that he wasn't there. I went. As soon as the car door closed, we sped off. Fast. Really fast. I looked over at him wide-eyed. He was scream crying with absolutely no expression on his face. Tears streaming, but emotionless. He just keeps whispering. You were supposed to love me. Over and over and over again. He starts speeding faster. If I can't love you, then no one else can. I'm actively having a straight panic attack in the passenger seat. I can't hear because my ears are ringing, and I can't see a thing either. Meanwhile, Kayla had already called my mom, and somehow my mom had left the house fast enough to track us down in that PT cruiser. He parked at a church. My mom was watching us. Ernest had a box cutter at his side. I got a call from my mom. I can't really remember what she said, but I know it was something along the lines of, I'm gonna slit your fucking throat, to Ernest. He started coming to his senses, if you can even call it that. He dropped me back off at Kayla's, and told me he was going to kill himself immediately after. Kayla and I were frantically trying to call his parents about a possible imminent suicide. However, they couldn't speak English. He called the police on himself because he thought he was going to harm himself or someone else. He was gone for a couple of weeks, and when he came back, he was parked outside my school waiting for me to come out. He ran right up to me. I noticed he had on a plaid button-up shirt and it was tucked into his pants, which was extremely odd to me. I knew immediately that this was another one of his fake personalities. He was speaking differently as well, very proper almost like just a few weeks had turned him into a saint. It wasn't long after that that I admitted myself into a mental institution because I couldn't stop breaking down. Everyone in the groups told me to get rid of him, and I had not realized how serious this was until I saw everyone's reactions to my stories. There were so many incidents with this psycho that I can't even type it all out. I did get rid of him. I found new friends, and without them, I don't know how this would have gone. I haven't seen or spoken to him in about three years, and thankfully, I don't think we'll ever meet again. This happened a few years ago, when I was around 20 or so. I was hanging out with my buddy Matt at my apartment, located in the downtown area of a medium-sized Midwestern city. We were drinking whiskey, watching comedies, playing tunes. He mentioned that he had this close friend, Emily, who used to live in my apartment building with her mother. 
She now lived across the street from me, and he thought it would be a swell idea if we met, because apparently we're very similar. I was single and ready to mingle at that point in my life. He rings her cell and tells her to come by my place. She arrived at my apartment and I instantly became fond of her. She was hilarious, very pretty, and a musician just like me. She was around 30, so 10 years older than me. My friend Matt was 35. I've always had friends that are much older for some reason. We played songs together and laughed hysterically for hours. Matt decided this was a good chance to go home and leave us two alone. We chilled for a while longer, ended up making out and I got all of her contact info before she told me she was going home and we would meet up again soon. Over the next few weeks, we developed quite a strong relationship and we hung out almost daily. I would just throw on some pajamas and walk across the street and we get wasted together and watch movies. It was awesome. After arriving home from my 10-day trip to New York City, though, things got real weird. The day I returned, she asked if she could come over, so I unpacked all my shit in a hurry and told her to stop by. She rings the buzzer, takes the elevator seven floors up to my apartment, and lets herself in. I was talking non-stop about all of the awesome things I did and people I met in New York City, but I could immediately tell she didn't want to hear a single word of it. She would change the subject every time I brought it up, and eventually she just said, Can you stop talking about New York? I really don't give a fuck. I was surprised to hear her speak like this. The Emily I had been getting to know was not like this. She was a caring, passionate, and amazing person. Or so I thought. Fast forward to a few nights later. I had just gotten home from working a 12-hour shift. I collapse in bed, ready to pass out for the night. It was about 9 p.m. when I get a text from Emily. Hey, what's up? I didn't feel much like replying at the moment. I was too exhausted, and our last hangout was too weird for me to comprehend. I was still trying to decide how to deal with everything. I plugged in my phone to charge, turned the lights off, and fell asleep almost effortlessly. All of a sudden, though, I wake up to someone slamming on my door and screaming at the top of their lungs. Open the fucking door! Let me in, now! My entire apartment reeked of cigarette smoke. I grabbed my phone from beside my bed. My heart was beating a million miles per hour. Twenty-seven missed phone calls a bunch of text messages, all from Emily. I scan through the texts while she's at my door screaming, trying to break it down now. I see the most recent text from her is a long one, claiming I'm a piece of shit for not responding earlier, and that she's coming over to beat the shit out of me for not doing so. She had a key to the building still, from when she used to live there. I get out of bed, nearly having a panic attack, I try to decide what my next move should be. Should I open the door and try to calm her down? Should I call the police? Is it possible to just ignore her? I decide to open the door. She begins wildly wailing on me, swinging her arms trying to hit me. She was smoking a cigarette and there were three cigarette butts on the ground next to her. Smoking indoors was prohibited in my apartment building. She was also obviously on some sort of drug. She kept screaming at me, telling me how awful I am for not responding, slurring her speech and losing her balance. I was somehow thankfully able to calm her down without much more violence. I took her to the roof of the apartment building, which had a pretty nice little enclosed picnic table area. We sat beside one another. She was quiet now, finally. She kept asking me how I could be such an asshole, and I needed to explain myself right now. As I looked into her eyes, I could see pure evil as she spoke to me in an eerily calm demeanor. In that very moment, I said to her, Emily, I don't ever want to speak to you again after tonight. This whole scenario is absolutely insane. You need help. Let me walk you home. I took her home and returned to my apartment to attempt sleeping, at which I was not able to succeed. A couple days later, I return home from work, and there's an envelope tape at my door. I open it, and it's a handwritten letter from Emily, 
apologizing and saying I'm a beautiful human who doesn't deserve an evil person like her in their life. There was a candy bar attached to the envelope, one that I'd never heard of, that she had always told me I needed to try. I never spoke to her again after. From what Matt tells me, which by the way he always knew she was a problematic person, she's a heavy user of crack now, and is working as a food runner in a restaurant nearby. This happened over 20 years ago. I was driving back home with my girlfriend at the time. It was Christmas Eve, and my mother's family used to hold this large celebration at my aunt's house in Estacada. This was my girlfriend's first time meeting my extended family, but she got along quite well with them. We spent the majority of the afternoon and evening talking, playing poker, opening presents, and drinking a vast assortment of adult beverages. My girlfriend had become quite inebriated by the time we had to leave. Therefore, I would be the one driving us home. It was around 11 p.m. or so. I was driving my girlfriend's car along Highway 211. Now, this stretch of road is surrounded by farms and dense patches of forests, and parts of it are unlit. Nothing to fear, though. I grew up in this area so I knew this road like the back of my hand. The both of us were just driving and talking away, just two young lovers making the most of our moments together. There's a portion of the highway that descends down this enormous hill before crossing Deep Creek. Surrounding both sides of the road are thick forests. There are no lights. The only thing we could see was the area directly in front of our headlights. I drive down the hill, cross the bridge, and go uphill through more forest. It's as the highway starts to flatten out that it happens. Something sprints across the road so suddenly that I almost slammed into whatever it was. I smash the brakes. I turn to my girlfriend and ask her if she just saw that. She confirmed that she had, but she couldn't make out what it was. Maybe it was a coyote. They were a fairly common sight in the area. Something just felt off about it. Whatever it was that ran in front of the car disappeared into the woods next to the road. Coyotes don't usually just dart out in front of cars. Not like that, anyway. For some reason, I decide to check it out. I turn my car around and switch on the high beams to better light up the forest into which this thing had vanished. I step out of the car and walk toward the woods. I don't see anything but now it feels like perhaps I've just made a grave error. My heart is pounding, and the hairs on the back of my neck are standing at full attention, but I can't see anything unusual in the trees. Suddenly, the car's horn blasts. It's not a beep-beep-beep that you'd get if, say, your driver or passenger wanted you to hurry up and get in the car. It was a long and blaring honk. I walked back into the car and asked my girlfriend why she had suddenly leaned on the horn like that. She said nothing. Instead, she pointed to a spot about 50 feet from where I was standing. I looked over in that direction, and that's when I saw it. Surely, this was the thing that ran in front of our car. It was a man. He was completely naked. His skin was covered in dirt and mud, and in one of his hands... He was holding a hatchet. He looked back at us, and then he smiled and waved, before turning around and walking slowly back into the forest. Needless to say, we got the hell out of there. Once we were safely driving again, my girlfriend explained what had just happened. While I was trying to look for the man in the area he had initially vanished in, he'd circled back around and come from another spot in the forest beyond my car headlights. My girlfriend had seen something out of the corner of her eye, and that's when she saw him. Before she honked the horn, he was slowly walking toward me. His hatchet raised as if making to strike me. We called the authorities once we got safely back home, but they never found anybody. Or maybe they did and just didn't think to tell us. But the officer we spoke to explained his theory. The man was obviously looking to ambush unsuspecting lone travelers for who knows what reason. We all agreed that my girlfriend's quick thinking saved my life, 
as it let my potential killer know I wasn't alone out there. I moved back into the area recently, so I now drive that highway often. No naked hatchet man sightings yet, thankfully. But I can tell you that I'm definitely extra vigilant now, especially down near Deep Creek. A bit of a preface here. I was around 10 to 11 years old when this happened. Old enough to stay home alone, but not old enough to recognize some red flags. I attended camp over the summer, the typical 8 to 3 routine. My house sits close to the end of my street, which forms a U, but for some reason the bus driver would never drop me off at my actual house. Instead, I would always get dropped off right at the end of my street, where I would toddle myself along back home. Both my parents worked late hours, sometimes not getting home until 8 p.m. It would be very expensive to hire a babysitter for four to five hours a day, five days a week. So, starting in sixth grade when the bus dropped me off at home, I would be all by myself. I'd do the usual middle school routine, play games online and watch a lot of TV. Occasionally, my neighbor's cat would come into my backyard, and I would feed and pet her as a way to get outside. The only computer in the house was in my dad's workroom, which has a window overlooking the desk, and a window overlooking the side of the house as well. We have large bay windows in the living room, dining room, and kitchen of my house, and since we sit on a hill, you can pretty much see the entire backyard from a nice vantage point. Most days when I got home, I'd toss off my backpack and go right to that room. You could see me walk from my front door and pop up by the computer from outside. Unfortunately, this would lead to something that I had nearly forgotten about up until now. That day, I got off the bus and I did as expected. Went to my dad's work room and got started playing computer games right away. About 30 minutes into this though, I could hear a faint meowing coming from outside the window. I paused the game and looked outside, thinking maybe my neighbor's cat had wandered over once again. Nothing. I just sat back down and resumed playing, only to hear the meowing again not long after. It was quiet but still very noticeable, so I checked the other window as well. Still nothing. This routine happened for a good 10 minutes or so. Eventually, I got frustrated and went to the living room to watch TV. Not even two minutes later, meowing from the window I was sitting right beside. Now I was starting to get confused as well as a bit creeped out, so I shut the blinds tight and kept trying to watch TV. The meows continued, but only when they came from the window right behind me did I jump up and flee the living room, officially skeeved. I went into my bedroom, where the blinds were down but still cracked open for some sunlight. I started to read a book, only to hear the meow coming from outside my bedroom window. This was enough to make me call my dad, concerned that maybe the cat was hurt, but I couldn't see it to be sure. He said he would have the neighbor come check it out, and call me back ten minutes later. Ten minutes go by, and I get a call from my dad saying he was coming home early from work. Nothing urgent in his voice, just that his job had gotten cancelled at the last minute and now he could come home early. I really didn't think anything of it. Only when he got home did I finally realize the cat noises had suddenly stopped. Fast forward to the present, and I asked my dad about that strange incident, thinking it was so funny that the cat had followed me around all night. What he told me next made my blood run cold. After I called him, my neighbor did indeed come to check on the house. What he found were large footprints, leading in circles all around our home, clustered close to the walls, so that even if I looked outside, I wouldn't have seen anything. Someone had been stalking me through my house, seeing where I was through the windows, and making cat noises to try and get me to come outside. They must have known I was home alone since it was easy to see me walk by myself down the street and let myself in. My neighbor had immediately called my dad and searched the property as well, but he didn't find anyone. The police weren't called in the end. 
since there was no evidence but footprints that led off into the woods and eventually got lost. I never saw anyone either. My dad stayed home with me for the rest of the week. It sickens me to know that there are people who would use these tactics to try and lure kids out of their homes, and from there, do whatever they wanted with them. I'm currently a uni student, and on Tuesday nights I come home pretty late. Not late enough that my parents would call the police or anything, but definitely missing the regular bus times. Anyway, as luck would have it, I managed to catch the very last bus one Tuesday night after getting to the station. Typically, it's nothing to be worried about. If you keep to yourself and stick to safe-looking people, other uni students, mothers, the bus driver, you'll be alright. Growing up in a dangerous country and migrating to a much safer one still hasn't rid me of those instincts. That night, I got all these bad vibes and was feeling a weird buzz. Something was off that evening, but I couldn't quite tell what it was. We get to the main stop, the shopping center, and I find out that the bus has terminated its route. It's done for the night. Thank you very much, asshole bus driver. Well, fuck. It's dark, it's late, I can't drive, and my parents can't pick me up. I'm too broke to afford a taxi as well, so all I can do is walk home. I guess the exercise would be good for me. Now, from the shopping center, it would take me a good 20 to 30 minutes to reach my house, and that's if I power walk the entire time. I could probably run home, but fuck that, dude. When you leave the shops, if you follow the road, there's a local Catholic school, a public library, a public school, and a few bus stops along the way. Near the library is a traffic intersection, the most brightly lit area of this entire road, but it's also a very small square. It's a joke, honestly. As I'm walking, it takes me less than a second to realize just how dark it was on that street. It was honestly a bit creepy, walking by this local Catholic school with their massive crucifix in the middle of a huge mass of land. In front of me is a girl who looks about my age, Asian, and she's walking fairly quickly. Understandable, from the very corner of my eye across the road, I can see a man kind of half jogging, half walking. I wasn't sure what he was up to, but it was definitely suspicious so I decided to keep my eye on him and that girl. At the intersection, one of my friends was there. He greeted me very enthusiastically and gave me a hug and a kiss on the cheek. He momentarily distracted me from that weird running man and the girl as well. Between my friend and I greeting each other, I completely missed when the guy crossed the street and was now in my path. Well, turned out my friend was kind of a douchebag, because he just left me after I told him about this weird dude. I was not far from the creep at this point, and the girl. I could see he was now talking to her. If a guy has any common sense, he'll not speak to a girl or woman while she's alone at night. We've all heard the horror stories. By this stage, I'd quickened my pace into a sprint, holding onto my backpack so my laptop inside wouldn't make much noise. I was assessing my very limited options on how to help this poor woman. She was clearly in trouble now. I'm a very small, very unintimidating Asian girl, and the guy looked bigger and bigger the closer I got. I felt so tiny and incredibly stupid for doing this because I was still far away. I have crazy good eyesight though, and the streetlights just happened to be lighting up his face so I could make it out accurately enough in case I needed to identify him. He was a white male, early 30s to 40s. Brown hair, wearing glasses, striped long sleeve top and brown khakis. His eyes were super big, the kind of face you make when someone surprises you with something particularly scandalous. On my way there, I come up with what was probably the most stupidly brilliant plan I've ever concocted. I just kinda stood there hoodie on, feet apart, hands on my hips, and in my loudest, best impersonation of an older Filipino woman getting mad at her child, I made the strongest accent I could. Oi, what are you doing? 
Huh? You were supposed to be at home already. And talking to a boy? Huh? And he's white? Excuse me, look at me while I'm talking to you. I did not raise you like this. I don't remember exactly word for word what I said, but I was basically copying whatever my mom says when she's angry with me. The entire time I'm yelling, I can see the guy beginning to inch away. The girl looked so bewildered, like a deer caught in the headlights. At this stage, I was honestly expecting her to run away. I turned to the guy. And where do you think you're going, huh? He fucking ran for it. I swear it was like watching a real-time cartoon. The girl was still standing there. I took off my hood and waved to her. I was still very far away at this point and asked if she was alright in my regular accent. She was just staring at me. I apologized if I'd scared her, but I had to get him away. I remembered a story my younger sister would tell me about this creepy guy that liked to corner young girls in the park not far from where we lived. Anyway, we hugged and exchanged names and numbers, and now we're basically friends forever. It turns out that she didn't live very far away, and didn't even realize what was happening until she could no longer get away from the man. I ended up walking her home, and from there, her older brother dropped me off. We called the police while we walked to her place. When we retold the story to our families, at this stage, I correctly assumed they were Filipino as well. Communication was very easy. They banned us completely from taking the bus past seven. I was reluctant in telling my friends this because I knew they'd laugh, but it was such a serious thing. What if I hadn't been there? As comical as that sounded, she was really shaken up but very relieved and grateful. She kept hugging me and stuff, which is weird, I don't usually hug strangers. Police later stopped a nondescript station wagon about 20 minutes down the main road. It was a man matching my description exactly. They searched his car and found a few photos of girls in the glove compartment, and even more on his phone. They were all Asian, specifically Filipino. Months later, after I found out about this, Mom tells me they actually found photos of my sister and I as well. It made me shudder. Last year, I followed my boyfriend to his summer internship across the country. I didn't have many job prospects myself, given it was a rather economically depressed area. So, after applying to some minimum wage jobs and coming up with nothing but a telecom company, which I found way too depressing an idea to entertain, I got on a caregiving website to find a family I could nanny for. After a bit of searching, I found a family who needed weekday care for their two toddler-aged boys. I went to their house to meet them for an interview the following day. The parents, John and Sarah, were an early 30s, nice, easy-going couple, and the two little boys were sweet as well, so I quickly knew we would be a very good fit. During our meeting, they described the boys' schedules, eating habits, my chores, and then they told me about Ben. Ben was an old friend and retired war vet who lived in a side room off the kitchen, away from the other bedrooms. They said he'd fallen on hard times and had been living with them for the last few years, at least while he got back on his feet. They understood that it seemed a bit strange. They went out of their way to explain how John had known him his whole life, and Ben was basically a part of the family at this point, so he could be completely trusted. Alright, I mean, it's still kind of weird, but these people were doing a compassionate thing for their friend, right? I started working for them the next week, and didn't meet Ben until three days in, when I was getting ready to leave after Sarah returned home from work around the same time as him. I remember she introduced us, and he kind of just said hi in a very low voice then averted all eye contact when I said hello back and offered my hand. After very quickly shaking it, he turned his attention to the one-year-old saying a cursory, nice to meet you, which I returned before making my exit while chatting with Sarah. Nothing about the interaction seemed too off to me, except he did seem rather cagey. I just took it though as him being either generally shy or nervous around young women or something. As the summer went on, I didn't really see too much of Ben. He left for work between 8 to 10 a.m. most days, and he'd usually return home for lunch, but I rarely ever saw him. 
and if I did, all he'd do was offer a nod and return to his quarters immediately. Sometimes I'd see him outside doing some yard work. Only one time he came to get me, as I hadn't left enough room for his car to back out for work. That was probably my longest interaction with him, at least to my knowledge. One day, as the boys napped, I was swiffering the house, and although I wasn't responsible for Ben's room, I knew he wasn't home at the time. I was so curious about how a man like him lived, I cleaned what I could of it as well. Upon entering, I saw a room akin to a college-age male space. Most surfaces were covered with trash or clothing, and his bed had no sheets on it, just clothes on one half. On his desk was a three-monitor computer with the desktop on and the file explorer open, so as a generally nosy person, I was incredibly tempted to click around. My consciousness, though, got the best of me. This was the one time in my life I'm glad I wasn't a snooping bitch. To fast forward a bit, I continued working for their family, without much event, for the rest of the summer. I actually really enjoyed my time with them. Working for them was once a pleasant memory in my mind. That is, until two weeks ago when I suddenly got a call from Sarah. I had no clue what she could be calling about, as I had stopped working for them in August and returned to school since. Perhaps it was to catch up? I didn't think it could be anything like this. Sarah's voice trembled and eventually broke as she described to me what had just happened to them. Apparently a few hours earlier, the FBI had busted into their home, booted them out, ransacked it, and informed them that Ben not only had shitloads of child pornography on his computer, but he'd also installed secret cameras all over their house, which he was using to watch all of us. I was in a state of utter shock and horror upon hearing this. I don't remember how I responded, but she couldn't stop apologizing to me for subjecting me to such a gross violation. Of course I accepted her apology. How the fuck could she have possibly known? She then informed me I was going to be contacted by the authorities to give my statement about any odd experiences I'd had with Ben and that I could ask them any questions I had about the case. When we hung up, I immediately thought back to how I had almost searched through his computer. I could have very likely discovered his crimes at that time. After that, feeling sick to my stomach, I screamed into a pillow for a while, took a long shower attempting to get his disgusting pedophilic voyeur stink off of me. It didn't really help, and I cried myself to sleep that night, wondering if he'd ever hurt those little boys, and questioning if I could have done more to stop it. A few days later, I was contacted by a Homeland Security agent. I don't really know why both agencies were working on it. He asked me a ton of questions about Ben, and I told him what little information I had. I'd never knowingly experienced any abuse from him, though. He then told me the sheer extent of Ben's crimes. I was relieved that they had no evidence Ben had ever harmed the boys, at least, and his crimes only seemed to revolve around females. But in addition to the hidden cameras, apparently he sometimes upped the ante by creeping around outside the house, taking stealthy pictures of us through the windows. Was he ever really doing yard work? Not only that, during one of the times I'd napped when the boys did, he snuck into the living room where I'd laid on the couch and had an entire photo shoot of me sleeping, consisting of dozens of shots, some right next to my face. As if that wasn't horrifying enough, the sick fuck also had an entire folder dedicated to when I used the bathroom. Sarah, however, he captured naked all the time. Apparently, she was the main focus of this disturbed attention. There's more, but he said that was all that was pertinent to my situation. I opted to not learn any more about it, as I was already way too overwhelmed. Having never been the victim of a serious sex crime before, I'm still figuring out how to handle all of this and move past it. Beyond myself, though, I'm disgusted that such kind, wonderful people were able to be hurt like this by someone they considered a close friend. To be stalked in your own home, I just can't imagine how you'd ever get over that huge violation of trust. It chills me to my very core.
It was the fall of 2007, and I was 15 living in New York. I was a competitive athlete in high school, the type who got up before school for workouts and trained for long hours after. With recruiting season a year away, I was under tremendous pressure to perform in my sport, as well as in the classroom. I was struggling to keep up in calculus at the time, so my mom suggested I get a tutor. She made an appointment with a teacher friend of hers who really knew his stuff. I'd been going to him regularly, probably three times a week for a month, before I met Alex. Alex had the tutoring session after mine, and we'd crossed paths every week. It had never been more than a glance and a smile, as I was incredibly shy and terrified of boys. He was tall and blonde with piercing blue eyes, so naturally I thought he was very cute. One day, my tutor had to change his schedule and decided to book us together, as we were learning the exact same topics in calc. I was shocked and delighted when Alex started chatting with me afterwards and asked for my phone number. I had never had a boy pay attention to me in that way, and I was flattered that someone cute wanted my number. Eventually, Alex and I began dating. Alex went to Catholic school in another town, but because he lived in the same town as I did, he took the bus every morning from my school to his. This gave us most mornings together, and he was able to meet my friends as well. I was a little bit taken aback when they didn't immediately like him like I did. They mentioned him seeming quite weird, and I got super defensive, but I did let it go in the end. I realized that I'd been spending less time with them than I normally did, and assumed they were jealous I now had a boyfriend. As time went on, things got more serious. We started experimenting sexually, and eventually I lost my virginity to him in the back of his Ford Escape. That's when things began to change. While Alex and I always talked regularly, he started getting way over the top about staying in contact with me. He would make me stay on the phone with him at all hours of the night, until eventually my mom started taking my phone away before I went to sleep. This relationship also started taking a toll on my athletic career. I was too tired to spend my extra time training and started skipping my practices to see him, driving 30 minutes each way to his school. Eventually, my friends sat me down and told me how unhealthy this relationship had become. I had completely isolated myself from them and all of my free time was spent with him. I realized I wanted so badly to end the relationship. I had fallen out of love with Alex, and college applications were fast approaching. I had been scouted by no less than 10 colleges. My plan was to attend Brown, my dream school. Alex's obsession with our relationship had taken a huge toll on his grades, and Brown was not going to be an option for him. I remember when I told him that was where I was planning on going, he freaked out, saying he would never get in there and begging me not to go. At the time, I was also recruited by the University of Illinois. Alex applied there in hopes I would ditch Brown and go to Illinois with him. That was the final straw for me, though. I ended things for good with Alex, assuming that would be it. Because Alex would take the bus from my school to his every morning, I still had to see him. I remember walking into school past him and his classmates who took the bus with him. Some of his guy friends would call things like slut and whore at me. Apparently, he had spread a rumor I had cheated on him with a bunch of guys and then ended it with him. I tried to ignore it until I started getting Facebook messages from random people around his school. I spent months getting these nasty messages from guys at his school, accusing me of having STDs and telling me I was going to get gang banged by his friends. Eventually, I had to delete my Facebook because it just would not stop. I think deleting my Facebook was what set off the true stalker tendencies for Alex, though. He was no longer able to see my face online, so he started calling nonstop and sending desperate AIM messages telling me he loved me. While all this was going on, I was the favorite to win the high school championship in my sport. I'd gone undefeated all season. Alex ended up showing while I was competing for the championship, and I saw him there. It shook me so badly I ended up losing the title. 
I was furious and heartbroken. I picked up his phone call that night and screamed at him, telling him to never contact me again. That's when the threats began. I got a call a few nights later from him. After he texted me, he had something important to tell me. Stupidly, I answered. He began to tell me specifically how he was going to kill me. He was going to show up at my house when my parents were at work with a rope and knife and make me suffer like I'd done to him. I started to cry. He eventually went on to say he was going to get me before I went into school because he knew exactly where I parked every morning and my parents would never find my body. At this point, I had the fortuity to decide to record what was being said and taped it on my phone. I hung up once I felt I'd heard enough. The next morning, I went to school extra early, much earlier than I figured he'd possibly be able to be there. I showed my advisor the recording, who then called my mom. I remember feeling a deep-rooted sense of shame as my mom listened to it, like I had done something to bring this on myself. My advisor was so alarmed by the recording, he advised me to go to the police immediately. This day still feels surreal to me. My mom and I sat in the police station all day, explaining the story of my relationship with Alex and how everything got to this point. The police then drove to his high school and arrested him while he was in class. The topper on the day, though, was when I went out to bring food back to the police station for my mom and I. I pulled into the station at the same time as the car holding Alex did. I saw him in cuffs, and I could see in his eyes that he really wanted to kill me. Post-arrest, I got a restraining order against Alex, and he was sent to a mental institution for a while. He ended up breaking the RO on more than one occasion. I contacted the police, but they didn't think it was cause to do anything. I think it's important to note that Alex's family was wealthy and had a big name in the area, so it wouldn't have surprised me if that's why they brushed it under the rug. I ended up attending Brown and had to inform them of the RO and let them know Alex should not be allowed on campus. It's been over 10 years since this all happened, and I still continue to receive friend requests and phone calls from him on occasion. I recently moved across the country from where this occurred. I finally feel safe now that I'm so far from where he lives, but anytime I get a blocked call or a text from a number I don't know, it goes through my head immediately that that must be him. It's safe to say that this experience has completely changed who I let into my life and who I choose to date. So I, 19 and female, was at a house party a couple days ago. I only really knew a couple of the people there and it was pretty packed as well. I hung around with two of my friends there for a while, having some drinks here and there. After a while though, my friends went into this room that everyone was hotboxing in. I didn't go in myself because I didn't really feel like drinking and being stoned at a party where I barely knew anyone. Instead, I just mingled around for a bit, then went on my phone talking to my other friends. I noticed though at some point that this guy kept staring me up and down and instantly felt my stomach sink. I'm no stranger to people trying to catch my eye to strike a conversation or flirt, but I just instantly had a very bad feeling about this guy. I looked back down at my phone and sent my location to my friends, just letting them know where I was. Things were changing from feeling chill to suddenly being very sketchy. There were a bunch of soda cans in the kitchen, so I got up to grab a Sprite instead of having any more drinks. I'd brought my own alcohol with me, and I would never accept any drinks from strangers. As I'm there, the guy that kept looking at me before comes in and started trying to get me to take this drink in a solo red cup from him. Of course, I said, No, nah, that's alright, I have a Sprite, but thanks though. He kept trying to force it on me, and I was getting pretty annoyed because he was being super pushy. At this point, I was pretty blunt with him. Look, I don't want your drink or your company. Leave me alone. And I walked away. I thought that'd be the end of it, and pushed it to the back of my mind, as one of my friends came out from the hot box room, all stoned and happy. 
We hung out some more, and my friend wanted a cigarette, so I went out on the balcony with her. As we're out there, she puts her cigarettes on the ledge, and as she's talking animatedly, her arm accidentally pushed her cigarettes off, and they fell down into the yard. I was gonna go downstairs and outside with her to get them, but she told me she had to grab something from her car anyway, and that she'd be right back. I decided just to wait there for her. I'm on my phone and I hear the door open. I expected it to be her. As I'm about to say, that was quick. I spin around, and suddenly I'm face to face with that same guy from earlier. He immediately grabbed my face and kissed me. I pushed at his chest and said, What the fuck, dude? Did you not hear what I said? He proceeded to say something in Spanish, which I can't speak, but I could pick up a few words he was saying. I had a friend who was an exchange student, and she taught me all of the naughty words. I told him to fuck right off and went to push past him to go back inside. He proceeded to push me up against the wall and try to kiss my neck. That's when I pushed him away as hard as I could. He let go of my wrists and grabbed my throat hard while maintaining eye contact and smirking at me the whole time. Just when he used his other hand and grabbed my ass, my friend came back from getting her cigarettes, poked her head out, saw what was happening, and tried to intervene. He shoved her with his other hand. I heard her say, what the fuck? Oh, hell no. She grabbed the closest guy to the door from inside and brought him out for assistance. The random, heroic guy from inside then grabbed the crazy throat grabber, putting him in some type of hold, and started screaming at him. He got kicked out, and I'm pretty sure people punched him in the face on his way out too. Everyone was super apologetic and said they didn't even know who that guy was, and weren't sure how he'd gotten there in the first place. I wasn't about to call the cops or anything, because, like, I wasn't gonna get the party busted, but I went to the bathroom and immediately broke down crying. I called my other friends, since my friends that were here with me weren't sober enough to drive, and they came to get me. I still have a couple of finger mark bruises on my neck. I'd hate to think about what would have happened had my friend been distracted by something and not come outside when she did. At least I know my intuition works great. But let me say, I'm never again going to a party where I barely know anyone anymore. That was scary as all hell. This story starts on a Thursday night in May 2017. I work in retail, and after a long shift one night, I called an Uber home so I could avoid the dodgy people that sometimes hang around the train station. I wish I had known, though, that this simple act of calling for transportation would lead to a six-month-long ordeal of harassment and obsession. I got into the car and chatted with the middle-aged driver, who I'll call T. He had a strong Turkish, I think, accent, and seemed very friendly initially. The conversation was fairly normal at first, with him asking where I worked and why I was out so late, what I was studying. As the conversation progressed, he began to make comments that started to make me feel uncomfortable. He started to comment on how pretty I was and how young I looked. How he missed the times when he was young and could get so many girls like me. He then put his hand on my knee and patted it affectionately and tried to push my hair out of my face. I was aware that he was controlling a moving vehicle, so I just ignored him and prayed that we would get to our destination faster. When he pulled up to our place, he noticed a car was in the driveway and immediately retracted his hand. He asked me if I wanted to go out for coffee sometime. I politely declined, said I had a partner already. He told me that he was a lucky man, and I could call him any time for a free ride. He then reached out and kissed my hand. I felt physically sick but thanked him for the ride and got out as fast as possible. As soon as I was inside, I told my boyfriend what happened, who encouraged me to report the driver. I was apprehensive at first because he knew my address already, but eventually I did report it, as I knew we were moving soon. I was reassured by Uber that the matter would be investigated and received a full refund for the trip. 
I didn't hear anything from T after that and was soon busy into my study schedule, working and moving house. I had forgotten all about him until around August, where by chance I ran into him in our cafe. I was in line to get a coffee when I got a sudden tap on the shoulder. My heart sank. He gave me this big smile and tried to give me a hug as well, which I declined. Hey there, I've missed your pretty face. Where have you been? I'm super busy, sorry, I can't really talk right now. I sputtered. I ordered my coffee hastily and burst out the door with him hard on my tail. He started walking beside me, matching my pace. I was starting to breathe heavily and hyperventilate. Hey, so I could have bought you that coffee. We still need to go on that date after all. I told him no, I was not interested and he was making me uncomfortable. Then he grabbed my hand as we were walking. What the fuck? What are you doing? Oh, is that too soon? Too soon? Too soon for what? We're not on a date. I don't even know who you are. Leave me alone. I said this loud enough for people around me to hear me, and a few people had started to pay attention. Oh, are you a lesbian or something? No, what is wrong with you? I'm just not interested in you. I was mortified. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to upset you, he said. He then patted my back. I physically flinched and walked away from him, close to having a mental breakdown. He called out from behind me as I was leaving. Hey, you still work at that shoe store, right? I realized then that I had told him where I worked that night, and he had picked me up and seen me in uniform as well. I had also told him where and what I studied. I couldn't believe my own stupidity. I alerted my store manager, who then alerted shopping center security who assured me that they would be on the lookout. Sure enough, my first shift back after that cafe run-in, my manager told me that someone had come in asking for my phone number and when I was next on shift, claiming to be my boyfriend. My manager refused to give this information and notified security immediately, but by the time they had arrived, he had left already. They showed me the grainy security footage of people coming into our store around that time. And sure enough, it was T. I was told that if he came in again to go hide out in the back and the other girls on shift would deal with him instead. A few months later, he tried to add me on Facebook. I immediately changed my name so I couldn't be identified anymore and blocked him. The most recent incident happened in September last year. I was tidying the window display out the front of the store when I immediately felt like I was being watched. I looked to my left and sure enough, T was right there. I pretended not to know him. Can I help you with something, sir? Just admiring your beauty, he said with a smile. He then gave me an envelope and walked out before I could say anything else. Inside was a card saying that he'd really felt a connection and thanking me for my help today, even though I never actually got to serve him. It was also a voucher for the local bikini store for $100. I realize now is the time to involve the police and I'm kicking myself for not contacting them in the first place. I haven't heard from him in a while, so I'm praying that I don't ever again. I'm still wondering though if I should involve the police even though it's been a while since we last made contact, just in case he tries something else. This happened when I was four or five years old. I was at a rather large toy store with my dad and sister, who was two years older than me, so that I could pick out a birthday present for a friend of mine. My dad and I were looking at the Lego sets they had available, while my sister was just sort of shuffling around, bored out of her mind. At some point during all of this, she wandered away, I was looking at the box of this castle set, sort of wishing that it was my birthday coming up instead, when my sister returned and tugged on my dad's arm. What is it, sweetheart? He asked without looking away from the box he was holding. I think he also wished it was his birthday coming up too. There's a man... Oh, never mind, he's gone now. My dad looked at her, putting the box back on the shelf. What man? He asked. 
There was a man who asked if I wanted to come see his puppy, and I said I'd have to ask you first, but I don't know where he went. My dad took the box out of his hands and put it back on the shelf, then took my hand in his and put the other hand around my sister's shoulders. Well then, let's go find him, my dad exclaimed, and began leading us towards the checkouts and exit. Now like I said, this toy store was rather large and we were walking very fast. As we got near the checkouts, my sister pointed out a man who was just about to leave the store and said, That's him! I could see how she recognized him from behind. He had very notable long hair. It went more than halfway down his back. I remember him having a black winter coat on as well, which was strange because it was a pretty warm day out. He walked even faster after that, until we were at the nearest checkout. My dad said to us, Stay here with this nice lady for a second, okay? Referring to the cashier, he ran up behind the man who was now almost out the door, threw his hand on his shoulder so hard I could hear it all the way from there. My dad spun him around and began yelling in his face. Where's the puppy, huh? Where's this puppy you wanted to show my daughter? The people around started looking over at the commotion and my dad continued. You wanted to take my daughter to see your puppy, right? So where is it? I want to see this puppy too. The man was stammering and stuttering and trying to get away, but my dad had a very firm grasp on the man's shoulder. Turning his head to where we were standing, my dad yelled to my sister, This is the guy who asked you to come see his puppy, right? My sister silently nodded her head and then looked at her shoes. I think she thought she was going to be in trouble. I didn't blame her. Our dad was very angry. So where is it? In your car? Where's your car then? Is that it over there? He pointed out the glass door into the parking lot. Or is that your car? Is that where the puppy you wanted to show my six-year-old daughter is? I remember thinking that if he just let go of the guy, he could lead us to the puppy. Before I knew it, though, three men in yellow jackets rushed in. There was a word on their jackets which I couldn't read at the time, though I knew all of the letters. My dad let go of the man, and the yellow fellows held him instead. My sister was crying at this point. My dad walked back to us, once again taking my hand and one of his own, and putting the other gently around my sister's shoulders. He asked the cashier if she had a phone he could use, and she took us into the office. He called our mom to come pick us up, then assured my sister that she was not in trouble. In fact, she was in the least amount of trouble anyone had ever been in in the history of the entire world, simply by coming and asking his permission to see the puppy. I asked him if we were still going to go see it. He just looked at me and said, Sorry, son. It seems the puppy ran away. Our mom came in just a few minutes, and as we were leaving, there were already police cars showing up. Are they going to help him find the puppy? My sister asked my mom, but she said, No, they're here for something else. The other day, after listening to a lot of stories, I remembered this incident and asked my dad about it. Apparently, when the cops searched the man's car, they found the standard rope, duct tape, a knife, pliers, and a hacksaw. Also, at the guy's apartment, they found a shitload of child porn. My dad and sister testified at his trial, and the guy got 20 years, which means, barring other circumstances, he must be out by now. I also asked my dad if my sister knew about the stuff in his car. He said no, and to keep it that way from now on. I had a very creepy friend at one time. We'll call him Ben. I believe he might be a dangerous psychopath, or at worst, a serial killer. Ben and I met on Facebook in 2014, and he came to meet me in Romania in the summer of 2015. He seemed a little bit odd, but otherwise he was perfectly fine. One strange thing about him is that while he was at my house for a week, he didn't bathe for some odd reason, so he stank to high heaven. So I show him around Transylvania and we both rent an apartment in Bucharest before his departure. We hang around for a bit and then he leaves. Our friendship continues online, and in 2016 I move back to Canada. 
In May of that year, I fly over to Vancouver to hang out with him. Now, it's important to note that this guy was a major gun nut. He collected a lot of firearms and claimed to have briefly been in the Canadian military. He also claimed he worked as a mercenary and was in Georgia during the Russian invasion in 2008. He claimed to have shot two people there and also to suffer from PTSD. I get there and his apartment is filthy. I'm talking trash everywhere. Two cats as well that made the place stink of cat piss. The guy kept his lights on 24-7 and on his wall was a clock that played a loud tune every hour. His behavior toward me while there was somewhat disrespectful, but I took it just as a buddy messing around with me. He did say some mildly creepy things, but again, I brushed it off as him just being a prankster. I leave again and our friendship continues online. During this time, his conversations with me became darker and more hostile, in a passive-aggressive sort of way. Ben was also a hardcore alcoholic who would often drink until he passed out. He did all sorts of antisocial and even downright vile things when he was drunk. Also, during this time, in the 2016 to 2017 period, he said that two men had briefly lived with him for a very short time. When I'd press him about what happened to those two men that lived with him, though, he changed the subject very quickly. After what happened in 2018, when I last met up with Ben, I have a strong suspicion something very bad might have happened to them. Fast forward to 2018. Me and my parents are driving to Vancouver from Calgary. Perfect time to meet up for a day or two with Ben. This was a big mistake, though. We met up at a bar near his house. We had a few drinks and he went home for the night. The next day we met up again and his behavior toward me was a lot more disrespectful in a passive aggressive way and extremely creepy actually. We went to his workplace and he was very subtly disrespectful to his co-workers as well. He kept putting me on the spot, trying to make me look stupid to everyone around. He was a supervisor so most of the people underneath him were too complacent or afraid to say anything. The man was obviously a psychopath. This is where it gets to a point where I believe my life was in danger. We go back to his place, he's drinking a beer, I'm rolling a joint, a movie is playing and Ben is getting very tipsy. He basically adopted a speech pattern in our conversation where I started to feel as though I was being interrogated and even possibly toyed with. He was playing a video game on his computer while I was watching a movie. By this time, I was feeling very uneasy. My gut instinct was telling me to leave. Generally speaking, you should always try and listen to that. That primal thing inside you linked to fight or flight is best to be obeyed. Now as the day progressed and Ben was becoming more drunk, he started to say some very weird things. I don't care about anyone but myself. I don't give a shit about people. There was a loaded shotgun beside the table. He looked at his computer screen and started mumbling something about being a madman with a gun. A few minutes later, he turned to me. Hey, what if I put some MDMA in your drink? You know, I'm, I'm just kidding, all right? The cat and mouse games continued. He was now talking about knowing a guy who was HIV positive and how he was going to get the guy to give it to him through an infected needle so he could live on government benefits for the rest of his life. This guy was getting unhinged. I was sitting there in disbelief at the vile things he was saying. I wanted to leave, but I also didn't want him to know I was ready to go. It was an awful, vulnerable feeling. He took another beer and turned to me. The talk was now about food. He turned and looked me dead in the eyes and asked, So, if this was your last meal, what would you like to have? The look on his face was one of stone-faced sincerity and malice. I knew I had to flee. My heart started pounding. I needed to make a move. With adrenaline rushing through my body, I told Ben in a very calm manner that the weed I had was making me feel very funny and I needed to step out for a breath of fresh air. I quickly slapped on my shoes and left before he had a chance to stop me. He made me promise I would come back but I leapt down the stairs into the sunlight. I felt like an animal that just escaped a slaughter. 
The place I'm staying at was not too far from Ben's house. I was wise enough to not tell him that's where I actually was staying, though. I started walking, feeling like I'd just escaped certain death. The phone rings. Ben is desperately asking where I'm at. He's panicking. I tell him I'm still taking a breather. Meanwhile, I go over to my cousin's house. I manage to get inside. By this point, night has fallen. The guy is calling my phone constantly. When I answer him, he's always trying to get me to meet up with him and go for a long ride. The tone of his voice was flat and fake, though. He tells me we just had a bad night. He's desperately trying to get me to go for a ride with him. I blocked his number. I blocked him on social media. That was the last time I spoke to that scumbag. In our many online conversations over the years, Ben would always drop clues here and there about his past, that he had done horrible things during his supposed gig as a mercenary. He would always go on these drunken tirades about being a bad man who did bad things. He was going to AA meetings and trying to put on a facade of normality by volunteering at an old folks home. Deep down though, I think he's a sociopath, a potentially dangerous one at that. I just hope he never hurt anyone, other than those two people he allegedly shot while on combat duty. Vancouver is a sketchy place full of missing people, though, so I guess we'll never know. I had a stalker from Xbox Live try to find me at work two days ago on Monday. I'm only 17 and worked second shift at my local movie theater. It was a Friday night, and my weekend had just begun. I was on Xbox Live playing some Overwatch, and eating now cold pizza like lots of my friends were. I was kicking some considerable ass, more so than I usually do at this game. I was on fire. For non-Overwatch players, it basically means you're doing really, really good. For three matches, at around 2 a.m., I decided I was doing well enough to step up my game and head on into competitive mode. I got into a match at King's Row, and I was playing Farah on defense. I got a 15-player kill streak, but I noticed that five of those were on the same guy. Uh, Bastion, I think. I still remember his username. The match went on for about another minute when I suddenly got an invite to a party. The gamer tag was the same as the Bastion I'd just killed for the sixth time. I wasn't in a party yet since all of my friends had called it a night except for me at that point. I decided that whatever he wanted to say to me could be interesting. So I added him. Now, I usually expect some kids a few years younger than me to be shit-talking me or something, but to my surprise it was a grown-ass man on the other end. More to my surprise, he sounded in his 30s, rather than closer to my age, and he had a very thick Spanish accent as well. Immediately, the guy started cussing me out. I can't lie when I say I half expected this to happen when I'd first gotten the invite. I had the mentality where, if you're a jerk to me, I'll return the favor in kind. I replied to his rants with the classic, Oh, you mad, bro? The guy didn't acknowledge me at all. Instead of saying some stuff like how he would fuck my mom or something like most people did, this guy said, Fuck you, your entire damn family. I'm gonna decapitate your mother and make your dad fuck her down her neck hole. I was sort of shocked by this at first, but it didn't really last. Bro, why don't you just take a chill pill or something? No, I want you to... He stopped. I noticed why. A DVA on our team had just killed his hero again. Now this is where things got scary. It sounded as if he'd transformed into a rabid animal that was trying to suffocate itself on the mic, and screaming, growling, and spitting all at the same time. It's hard to describe exactly what sound he was making, but it was pretty inhuman. It was like this person was being gutted and possessed by a horrible demon at the same time. This was a grown man, too, which made the entire thing scary, compared to how I'd be laughing my ass off if a 12-year-old lost it like that. The match ended. The enemy team didn't even get the payload moving. The man lost his shit because he lost. 
I decided to be a bit of an asshole again and not take this clearly crazy guy shit. Look man, it's not anyone else's fault you suck at this game. You're just being treated like the child you really are, so why don't you grow up, man? The Spanish guy really didn't like this. He just hollered, Fuck you! into the microphone for, no joke, 20 seconds. It started getting all crackly. He was being so loud that he was actually busting his mic. He then removed me from the party. I decided that since the match was over, I'd call it a night, just like my friends had. My overall reaction was something along the lines of, Oh, well, that just happened. I logged out, turned off my Xbox, and headed off to bed. As soon as my head hit the pillow, I realized how much of a dumbass I was for not recording any of this. My friends would have lost it when they heard it. Then I fell asleep. Saturday went by with nothing happening, and I thought that was that with this pissed off Spanish guy. Sunday was after Saturday and I logged onto my Xbox that morning to play some more on my day off. I noticed I had a message from that same guy. Good morning, my full name. I know you have to go to the address of the movie theater I work at tomorrow. Uh, what the fuck? I said out loud. I pulled out my phone and took a picture of the TV screen. I then texted my boss about it and told her some random guy on Xbox somehow found out where I worked. Well, my boss was a bitchy old lady, so naturally she didn't really care much about what happened on Xbox. Even though it did directly concern my work, she just blew it off and told me I still had to come in the next day. After all, Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom and The Incredibles 2 were so hot, so we were going to be very busy. I ended up coming in the next day at 5.30. It was pretty boring and very busy like I predicted, until about 8 o'clock when this super short guy came stumbling in through the door. It was pretty loud and crowded, but the guy fucking hollered my full name. Same thick Spanish accent from Xbox. Oh fuck, this guy is him. I still to this day don't know where he got all my info from, or why he decided to come all the way out to where I worked. It was just a game. The theater fell silent immediately. I just walked to the back room where my boss was, and told her the guy from Xbox was now inside. She repeated in person the whole I don't care what happens to you on Xbox, get back to work, we're busy rant that she had texted me. I repeated to her that the guy was inside the building. I didn't know if he wanted to hurt me or not, and I was going to call the cops. I actually did end up calling them. It wasn't until they arrived and spoke to me privately in the back room that my boss ended up taking me seriously. The Spanish guy was still waiting in the lobby. The cops put him in cuffs and walked him out. This is according to my boss. I was still in the back room so I couldn't witness it. I still haven't heard anything back from the cops yet, and I don't know how he found my info or why he chose to come all the way to where I worked. I also don't know what he planned to do to me. Either way, I'm still shaken up over it. I don't know if he knows my home address or not either, so I'm pretty much on guard 24-7. Either way, I own two dogs that can scare off pretty much anyone, but I'm still terrified of this guy. Throw away because this is something from my past I'm not particularly proud of. Also, this is pretty long, but it all comes together in the end, I promise. From the ages of 11 to about 16 or 17, I used to be addicted to playing MMORPGs. They were literally my life and I considered my online friends very real. And I loved them too. Except that I lied to them practically the entire time. You see, at the time I liked to pretend to be a girl. Not for the fun of it, but to target single teenage boys online for in-game currencies, gear, and whatever helped me progress through the game. Anyone who was an avid MMO gamer knows exactly what I'm talking about. You know, those amazing outfits you have to buy for real money. Those materials you just had to get with real money to progress through the game comfortably and be able to go against the best of the best. I was addicted, so I wanted all of it. Except I couldn't get it. I couldn't buy it myself. My parents wouldn't agree and I wasn't able to get a part-time job at that age. 
so I devised a plan around the ages of 13 or 14 that I would pretend to be a teenage girl and get into seemingly realistic online relationships with teenage boys and coax them into sending me things. I used the names and pictures of teen girls I found on the internet, on places like Flickr or Photobucket. Usually, when the boy decides to go snoop because he thinks I'm lying, he would find them and start believing it was really me. These type of people were already too desperate. I even voice chatted with them. My voice was very high-pitched even as a boy going through puberty, so it was like the perfect formula to trick them into liking and gifting me. You have to understand, I was desperate for all these things and I wasn't thinking straight because of my addiction. I never realized how much other people could get affected by this. On my first MMO, I tricked a boy into sending me an outfit by pretending to be his girlfriend. This boy seemed madly in love with me, and since this was my first time trying this out, I genuinely felt bad for him and wanted to tell him I'd lied to him. He was pretty similar to me in all aspects, actually. He wasn't well off either, he couldn't work, he had a bad home life, but my idiotic self decided it would be okay for him to gift me. I mean, what can it hurt, right? I thought. This huge identity scam I created escalated from there. I tricked so many other people. Teens, possibly even grown-ass men pretending to be teens. It was horrible. I hated myself the whole time, but I couldn't stop. I needed all these gifts in these games. And that's around where this story starts. When I was 16, the last guy I ever talked to like this was a 23-year-old Russian guy who we'll call Mark. I met him on a very popular shooting MMO. We hung out all the time and had many friends on that game. We voice chatted in a group of people multiple times on Skype while playing. I never once decided to scam him because he was a free player, meaning he never spent money on anything anyway. He also seemed like a genuinely nice dude, but when he asked me out, I tried to take on what I considered the biggest challenge in this scam. Would I be good enough to get a free player to spend on a game for me? Because I was so well liked online and many people knew who I was and generally I was a very nice girl, my ego was soaring. I knew I could do it. I accepted to date him online despite him knowing a 16-year-old girl as a 23-year-old man. In the beginning, he was pretty normal. He was always trying to be very sweet and romantic. We did things together all the time. He did all the lovey-dovey hugs and kisses texts, and we even had cyber sex as well. I, being the piece of shit I used to be, played along. It was all going well. Too well. However, I noticed after a week or two that something was not right with him. He seemed to be getting very possessive. He seemed very manipulative. He always talked shit about my other friends behind their backs to make me unfriend them. He would always tell me they talked shit about me too. Call them sluts, skanks, whores, and many other terrible names. He would even send proof, which I later found out was photoshopped, from in-game text chats, which disappear so you can't ask said friend to send proof they didn't say what they said. He absolutely despised any guy I ever talked to when we were playing a public match together. I stupidly went along with this. I didn't want him to not trust me so I could get what I wanted. Then the perfect moment came for me to set him up to send me some gifts. I had to do it. This new outfit the game introduced was too awesome to pass up. I started off by telling him the new game update was pretty cool and we talked about it for a while. He suggested we both get the new outfit, but I told him I had no money, and I totally would buy it for both of us if I could. He suggested that he stole money from his mother, a single hard-working woman taking care of two kids. For a second, my mind almost told me that this was okay, but then I immediately snapped out of it. That was horrible. I couldn't let it go that far. I couldn't believe what I was doing. Was I really about to tell this guy to go steal money from his mother who was struggling to pay bills? That was just, that was too far. I decided to log off immediately and shut off the laptop to rethink what my life was becoming. How many of these guys weren't in well-off families, but were probably using or stealing their parents' money like that? I had never thought about it before, 
but hearing it so directly, I couldn't stop thinking about it all day. The next day, I logged back into Skype at night and was immediately slammed with walls and walls of texts from Mark asking me where I went, why I wasn't answering, how I'm such a slut that went to talk to some other guy I know. Many similar things you'd hear from nice guys to girls that give them a chance to flake on them for being weird. I was sick to my stomach. I hated myself, and I hated Mark too. I tried to play it off and say my electricity cut off the entire day, but he didn't believe it. He refused to believe it. I immediately told him I wanted to break things off. But then things took a turn for the worse. He voice called me and I picked it up. He was hysterically crying, shouting at me. I tried to remain calm and told him I didn't want to play games anymore. I told him I was getting more depressed than I already was and felt my addiction to games wasn't helping me. I should go out and see the real world more. He started screaming at me, calling me all kinds of names, this 23-year-old Russian man, threatening what he perceived to be a 16-year-old girl. Everything he said started to get worse, talking about how I ruined his life, how he'd commit suicide if I ever left him, which I thought could possibly happen because he was a cutter already. I started crying and begged him not to. We got into a very heated argument and I could hear him throwing things around and smashing things. I was still crying when I told him I had to go because my parents wanted me to do something. He told me not to or he would kill himself right then and there. He turned on his camera and pointed a razor to his wrist. I saw all the old cuts on his arm. I was in fear. He couldn't see me, but I was stuck there watching this man threatening to kill himself live on cam, all because of me. All because I decided to trick him into buying me some in-game gifts. Because of this fake identity and fake relationship, I threw up in the garbage bin in my room. I screamed that I had to go, shut off Skype and close my laptop. I sobbed in my room the entire day, realizing karma finally got me and this is what I deserved for scamming people. I was a mess and suddenly I passed out asleep on my bed. I don't know how or when it happened but it did. The next day I was unusually calm. The day went by pretty normally. I sat there in front of my laptop staring, but I couldn't bring myself to open it. I tried to think of what I'd done and what I had to do now to fix all of this. I didn't want someone to kill themselves because of me, but there was no rational solution. I just had to say goodbye to him and block him, and whatever happened would happen. I opened Skype and was immediately slammed by walls of text again. This time I didn't read them but I saw he'd send some photos as well. Pictures of his arms bleeding from cuts he'd made last night after ditching him. Pics of him crying. I was immediately sick again, but took a deep breath and went in as calm as I possibly could. When he came online, I told him I was breaking up with him for sure. He again told me he was going to kill himself if I ever dared to leave him. Calmly, I told him if he was going to, then why didn't he? He didn't answer, clearly shocked by the question. He tried to threaten me this time. I told him I didn't care now. He could just find another girlfriend. He didn't need me. He still continued to threaten me. I was getting fed up. I tried to reason with him, even if I was on the verge of revealing I was actually a 16-year-old boy all along. But I decided with this guy it might not be the best thing to do. Regretfully, I told him to go kill himself so no other woman had to go through what he did to me, and then blocked him and deleted him. I deleted my Skype as well and never logged back in. I did see him around a few times on different games I played. He'd try to contact me every time, but I ignored him. He deleted me off his friends list in these games, and we never chatted again. After that, I stopped pretending to be a girl, and told all my friends I was a boy all along. I apologized so profusely. The girls felt betrayed because they really trusted me. Most of the boys who I let on felt betrayed because they liked me, but none of them really made a big deal out of it in the end. I realized how much of an asshole I was for even coming up with this plan, but I decided that I wasn't as much of an asshole as the 23-year-old man who threatened to kill himself live on cam in front of a 16-year-old girl trying to break off a pedophilic abusive relationship.